There we go. Well, everyone, welcome to Langchain 101. It's pretty wild to think that ChatGPT hasn't even been out for a year yet. It was launched November 20th, 2022, so almost just 11 months from here. And yet, there's some pretty wild claims out there about what AI can do and what it can't do. Some are saying it's a revolutionary moment in technology. Others are saying, well, you can make a ton of money using AI instantly. And even the CEO of Google says that AI is going to be more profound than fire. That one's my favorite, because that, that seems like it's the most ridiculous one of them all. But here's the reality of it is, we're seeing a ton of value come from AI already, and the people who are building that value are the builders. It's the developers, and it's the tinkerers, and it's the founders who are using this technology to create really awesome value for, um, for customers. Now, what we're going to go over today is we're going to go over one of the leading tools in the AI movement right now, specifically for language models. And that tool is called Langchain. Now, Langchain, well, we'll hear about what it is in just a second here, but you can think of it as an orchestration framework that's going to help you build your first AI-empowered uh, applications here. So, first of all, my name is Greg Kamrad, and ever since I got my first input, or I guess I should say output from a language model, my mind was absolutely blown. And ever since then, I've been tinkering, I've been building, and I've been teaching a ton of other people how to build their first AI applications. I post a lot of my work on Twitter, if you want to follow along there, or X, whatever you want to call it, and as well as YouTube. And if anybody wants to, that's a QR code to go and follow down there below hand. But this talk isn't about me. Let's learn about Langchain. The first thing that I want to show you here is going to be a quote from Harrison Chase. He's the CEO of Langchain, and in, we're going to hear what Langchain is in his own words. The way that we describe it or, or think about it internally is that Langchain is basically, and it's, I started off saying Langchain is a framework for building LLM applications, but that's really vague and not really specific. And I think part of the issue is Langchain does do a lot, so it's hard to be somewhat specific. But I think the way that we think about it internally in, in, in terms of like prioritization, what to focus on, is basically Langchain is a framework for building context-aware reasoning applications. All right, so that was a little verbose, but the cool part about that is the context-aware reasoning applications. Now, what's cool about this evolution is Langchain, it was primarily a language model um, uh, framework beforehand, but Harrison's already setting the stage for multimodal, which we'll go over in just a second here with the reasoning part. Now, to further emphasize why Langchain is so cool, I want to give a very brief timeline about how this language came about and why it's so important for today. So, the first PR for Langchain was just in October, uh, October 24th, 2022, which, again, is less than a year ago. They had their first tweet the next day, and then what really kicked them off was there was a viral hacker news post. This was uh, in January, so it took a couple months to build it up, but that's the way these things go. And then there was the first Langchain meetup. This was in San Francisco. And one thing I want to call it here, reading between the lines, they mentioned Benchmark as a sponsor. Well, well, I guess 10, 10K stars in uh, late February. And then two months later, they announced their fundraise from Benchmark. So my take is that they probably raised, and then they delayed the announcement for quite a bit. But they raised 10 from Benchmark. And then they raised, uh, I couldn't find the actual amount from Sequoia, but they were valued at a $200 million valuation when they raised from Sequoia here. So from first PR to $200 million in, you know, what is that, almost six months or something like that. And then uh, just in July of this year, they came out with their first managed service. Because one of the interesting things, if you're an open source package, well, what's the monetization path for that? And when you raise, two, uh, when you raise at a $200 million valuation, you're going to have to show some money somehow. So the first managed package is coming out, which I think is very interesting. And today, they have 63,000 stars with a lot of enterprise clients. And so this framework as a managed service and as a package is really starting to grow. Cool. Well, so for today, oh, I guess the last thing I'll say is um, Harrison and I recently did a webinar on fine tuning for tone. So this is how you get a language model to sound like somebody else. And so if anybody's curious for that, you can tell. But I just wanted to show that I'm not officially part of the Langchain crew, but um, friends of them. 
All right, so um, next thing is a small little plug. I have one more talk for this week as well. So on Wednesday, uh, I guess in room 10 at 12 p.m., I'm giving one more, which is a non-technical talk, and this will just be kind of on the state of AI and how it mixes with collective intelligence. So if anybody wants to go check that out, absolutely free to. Cool, so what we're gonna do today, when I was first asked to give a three-hour talk, I was like, man, that's kind of a long time. What am I gonna talk about for that long? But luckily with LangChain, there's a ton of really cool things to go over. So part one is we're gonna cover the fundamentals. And so when I say fundamentals, this is fundamentals of LangChain, but it's really fundamentals of working with language models uh, in the first place. So whether you wanna use LangChain in Python or LangChain for JavaScript, completely up to you. I know there's a talk later uh, this week um, with the founder of LangChain for J. But either way, the principles you learn here, whatever language you take it to, you're gonna learn a lot of really cool things. And then we're gonna take a 30 minute break. So from 2.45 to 3.15, we'll take a break. And then we'll jump right back into it with what could be my favorite section because then this is where we're gonna go over use cases. And use cases are cool because that's when you're actually doing the cool things. So we'll learn the nuts and bolts in the first place. And then we'll jump into some use cases. And I have plenty of use cases here because I've done a lot of YouTube tutorials on these. So we'll have bonus overflow if time. And we may even take a little bit of crowd participation to see what direction we want to go. The next thing that I'll say is I'll be pulling from a repo. And if anybody wants to follow along, you can go ahead and go jump on this one right now. The link is right there. The QR code is right there. And then just in a second, I'm also going to show um, a link to questions as well, because I figured it'd be pretty hard to grab questions as we we're talking right here. But I will have a Google form, submit the question. I will see it. And then we can go ahead and try to get your uh, question answered. Beautiful. Anybody else? No more? All right. So I'm ready to jump into some code. And I'm ready to have some fun with this. So let's, let's go for it. Awesome. So if anybody, if you're just watching now, by no means do you have to do, um, do you have to follow along with the code? But if you want to get this cookbook afterwards, go to that link that I sent you and check out all this code as you wish. Beautiful. So here's the LangChain cookbook. There's a lot of good things that we just talked about, which I won't go over again. Um, the why LangChain. I really just want to jump into some code. So first off, um, you can work with any model that you want in LangChain, which is pretty cool. And I'm actually going to give this a reset and clear output so we don't spoil any secrets here. Beautiful. So you can work with any model that you want in LangChain. Um, one of the really cool things about their website or about them in general is they have a ton of integrations. So one of the cool things about them, let's see if we can go to chat models. So even if you go to chat models, you can probably find your favorite one on here. Um, and so I'm using OpenAI today because I like GPT-4 and I like the uh, function calling, which we'll go over in a second, but use whatever model you want. So first thing I'll do is I'll import my um, environment keys here. And then really, we're just going to get started. And I almost didn't put this first cell on here about text. The reason why is because it's like, well, duh, Greg, no brainer. Of course, these are language models. But I really want to emphasize how simple a lot of this is. It's really just text in, text out, which is wild because when we talk about the entire AI space and the wave that's happening with it, it all comes down to how are we going to be manipulating text in order to do what we want for it. So simple, just to show you here, we're going to be working with strings. What day comes after Friday? It's, it's the same thing that we have out here. Now, the second piece that we're going to look at a ton today is going to be chat messages. So we have certain types of models in the OpenAI world. We have completion models, which just take in regular text and it gives you text out. But then we also have chat models. Now, chat models are pretty much the same thing. They're very similar. But you have a series of chat messages, which you go through. So I won't talk about the imports here, but anybody stop me if you want to. But either way, we're going to open up a chat model here, and this will be our model that we're working with. Then what we're going to do is, is we're going to call that model, and we're going to give it a series of chat messages. Now, the interesting part is when OpenAI came out with this uh, paradigm of chat messages, they gave us a few different types of chat messages. The very first one that they gave us is a system message. So system messages are going to be the instructions that you want the language model to take on. It could be its persona. Now, the reason why they came out with this, because they didn't always used to have this, is because we started seeing the language model go off track a little bit. It would hallucinate a little bit more. It would talk about topics that people didn't really want it to talk about anymore. But the system message was a really good way for you to give it instructions 
on what it should do. So very simply here, you're a nice AI bot that helps a user figure out where to eat in one short sentence. Okay, cool. That's the system message. That's the instructions for the bot. Now we're going to move on to the human message. Now human messages are supposed to represent actions that come from the user itself. I like tomatoes. What should I eat? Then let's see what the output is here. And what we get is our third type of message, which is going to be the AI message. Now, these AI messages are supposed to be what comes back in response from the, from the model itself. So here in the AI message, we get the content. You could make a fresh tomato salad or enjoy a classic tomato-based dish like spaghetti marinara. Cool. There's our AI message. And we just did our first completion from a language model. And if you ever want to know how much one of these things costs, we'll go over how to count tokens in the back. But this uh, request did just cost money. Um, so it is a paid service. And so whenever you start experimenting with this, just watch out. Now, of course, if you use your own local model, then you won't have to deal with that. Unfortunately, local models are a little t difficult to deal with right now. Now, the next thing with chat messages is we can also pass in history if we want to. So we, now we have a system message, human message, an AI message, and another human message. And the cool part about this is this last human message says, what else should I do when I'm there? The reason why I said this one is just to re-emphasize that it can pull from history and it can pull from context, which is nice. Because in the first message, or in the, it's a response to me, it says, you should go to Nice. Let me go ahead and load that up. Cool. When in Nice, France, blah, 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 blah. So it knew what I had said because order matters when you have these chat history messages and um, you don't have to stuff all that context into the last message, which is nice. And then finally, you don't even have to put a system message if you don't want to. You can just put a straight up human message and then it's just going to take its default instructions. I'm actually not sure what its default instructions are, but that's on the open AI side. I don't, I'm not sure what's on the other side of that. But Friday comes after Thursday. Nice. So there's our chat, there's our chat model. Next big topic that we have is also going to be around documents. So when you start interacting with these chats, it's not bad just having back and forth conversations, but the next step you're going to want to do is you're going to want to bring in your own data. This could be your Google Drive, your Notion, your emails, your WhatsApp, whatever it may be. And the way that you do that is you're going to, in, in the Langchain world, you're going to load that up via documents. Now, documents are just going to be text, which is held within page context. And then there's optional metadata that comes with that text. So this optional metadata is usually going to be your document ID, maybe your source, maybe the creation time, really whatever you want to put in there, which is nice. We'll go ahead and run that. But then you don't need metadata if you don't want to, or you can add it later. It's completely up to you. But that's on the document side, and we're going to see a bunch of these as we go through. Awesome. So if that is kind of like the nuts and the bolts of the schema wise about how we interact with the models, let's talk about the models themselves. And so, like I said before, there's a couple different types of models that OpenAI has. And the first one is going to be your completion model. And so underneath the hood, it's kind of taking a piece of text and just kind of completing what it thinks is the next best, to next best tokens after that. Um, I don't use completion models too much. Um, the reason why is because GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 are really the best and easiest models to use for my use cases right now. All the, they don't have a completion model that is as good as those two. So I'm always going to the chat models. Happy to chat more about that if anybody else wants to. So that was the completion model. Now we have the chat model, which you're already familiar with because we just went over those beforehand. And then the next one that I'll call out is going to be the function calling model. Now, this was a little bit of a bomb drop uh, a couple months ago. I think it might have been maybe four or five months ago. OpenAI um, saw that a lot of people were using these chat models to get structured output. So it's one thing when you want your chat model just to talk to another human. Freeform text is really easy and really good. But when you want your model to talk to another computer, well, computers don't like freeform text. They like structured data. And what's really cool is they gave us a model that will specifically give you structured data output. So now you can go and put this in between a few machines talking, and it's a lot easier for it. So I won't get into the nitty gritty specifics here, but basically you're going to give it a schema. And here I'm asking it to give me a couple properties based off of what a user said. I'm asking it for a location property, and I'm asking it for a unit property because we're talking about temperature here. And the user says, what's the weather like in Boston right now? So let me go ahead and run that. 
And then what the output tells me is you can see the content here is nothing. So it's not giving me an output, a uh, free form output back, but it is giving me a function callback. It's saying, hey, Greg, I think you should call this function. You should call your get current weather function, which is the name of this function that I told it here. And you're going to uh, put it for Boston because we extract Boston from what's out of here. The reason why I love this one, and I think this is so cool, is because you can start to see how you can get a query from a user's freeform response here. So if they start saying, hey, I want to see my uh, PNL statement for 2022, hmm, well now, in the old world before language models, you'd have to have some pretty gnarly regex that would pull that out or if something crazy using some NLP, but language models make that extremely easy, which I think is really cool. All right, so that is the function calling model. Now we're gonna move on to the text embedding model. So with the rise of language models, not only did we get freeform output back, but then we also got um, really awesome embeddings. Now embeddings are gonna be vector representations of semantic meaning of your text. All right, that's a really long way of saying you're gonna get a vector, which is just a bunch of numbers that represents the meaning of your freeform text. Let me show you what that means here. So I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have my text here. Hi, it's time for the beach. I'm gonna store that in and with my embeddings model, which I'm gonna use the OpenAI embeddings model, again you can use whatever model you want. I'm gonna say, hey, go embed this query and then I'm gonna give it my text right here. And we'll run this. And so now we have a sample well, I guess here's a sample of my embedding. And you can see here, it's just a list of numbers with length of 1,536. So this is quite a long vector here, but this is going to rent, uh, represent the semantic meaning of my text here. Now, the reason why this is important is because, well, if you want to know if two texts are similar, it's really tough to compare them just off their characters themselves. But if you have a vector, then all of a sudden you can do distance calculations. And those distance calculations tell you uh, if two things are similar or not, which we'll see why that is really cool in a second here. Next, we'll move on to prompts. And so we've talked about text, and we talked, uh, but text can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. And then it takes more of a sophisticated uh, mechanism in order to deal with multiple types of texts, different texts, dynamic texts, and that's where prompts come in. So we know prompts uh, as prompt engineering, or maybe <clears throat> you're checking on LinkedIn and somebody tells you that they have 30 prompts that are gonna like erase your copywriter or something like that. But in, in the LangChain world, prompts deal with prompt templates. And that's how you're gonna have dynamic values that are gonna be insert into your, um, insert into what goes to the language model. So we'll go ahead and we'll load this up right here. And so the very simple example is I'm just loading up a prompt uh, within a string. And so there's nothing that's going on crazy, but just wanted to show you the base case here. But in LangChain, we move on to the prompt template. Okay, so now the prompt template is gonna be kind of like an F string within Python. Or you can put a placeholder within a certain prompt and then it will dynamically put in whatever value you want it to be. So I'm calling my template again right here, but now I have a placeholder. And I'm gonna say location, which is in curly braces here. And then I'm gonna create my prompt template, which is gonna take my input variable, meaning, hey Greg, what are you going to go throw in this later? And then I'm going to give it the template, which is the prompt or the prompt itself. And then let's take a look at the final prompt. And so what I had said here is I want the prompt, I want you to format it, and location equals Rome. So this Rome is going to get thrown into the location here. I really want to travel to Rome. What should I do there? Respond in one sentence, blah, blah, blah. And then if we wanted to see what the language model would actually output with that, well, I'm just going to call language model and then get the final prompt. Explore the Coliseum, Pantheon, St. Peter's. Cool, so that's an easy prompt template where we just have one uh, location in there. But LangChain starts to provide some really cool flexibility for you for if you wanna do examples as well. So one of the cool things about language models is they can learn within the prompt itself if you give it a few examples about what you want. So say you're doing an extraction task. Well, a few examples of something getting extracted is a really good way to uh, teach it on what to do. And LangChain gives you example extractors, or uh, example selectors. The reason for this is because say you have 10,000 examples of really good data that you've gotten. Maybe it's from your users. Maybe it's from um, you know, your contractors or whoever. And you can't put all 10,000 of those in the prompt, nor would you want to. 
So you have to be careful about which examples you select for each specific prompt that you take in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another prompt template, and this is going to be my example prompt template. And then I'm going to give it a list of examples. And so I want to find the location that a noun is found in. So pirates are found in a ship. Pilot is found in a plane. Driver, car, tree is in the ground. Bird is in the nest. We'll run that. And so now I have my examples all loaded up. And then what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a semantic similarity example selector. That's a mouthful. But basically what that means is, is you're going to go pick examples that are semantically relevant to some piece of text that you gave it. And again, semantically relevant just means that they kind of mean the same thing or they're associated with each other. And we're going to specify k equals 2. We're going to ask for two of them back. And then here's where the cool part happens, because we're going to have a few shot prompt template. Few shot means you're going to give it a few examples. And generally, when I hear few shot, I think of like two or three or four. It's not too many. But let's run this. And so now what we'll do is I'm going to give it a noun. And I'm going to say plant, right? And I'm going to pop in noun. And it's going to go into my few shot prompt template. And what it's going to go do is in the background, it's going to go find, hey, which uh, examples did Greg give me that are most similar to plant? Well, I'm going to go take those. And I'm just going to take two of them because that's all that's all they asked for. Let's let's run this, and we can see what this actual prompt would be. So now we have two examples that are placed in here. We have our tree example and our bird example. Interesting, okay? And it's because our input is plant right here. But if I were to switch this to be student, well, all of a sudden we have driver, and now we have pilot as the examples. So this is a way to dynamically select what is going to be in your prompt and the examples that you're going to give. Now, if I were to actually run this in the language model, we can see that students are going to be found in the classroom. Nice. Next up, one of my favorite examples, one of the things I think is super, super cool, is going to be the output parsers. Now, this is a complicated way of saying, I want structured output out of the freeform text that the language model gives me. All right, so let's go ahead and load this up. Now, Langchain has support for output parsers, but this is kind of the old way of doing output parsers. I'll show you the method two in a second here, which is the one that I like and I recommend. But the way that it works in most cases is you're going to give a schema. And this schema is the data that you want back from the language model. And so I'll load up the schema here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it um, a bad string, meaning one a poorly formatted user input string. Let's imagine your user uh, isn't very trustworthy, and they input something you know, kind of bogus and you need to clean it up. Well, that's going to be their string. And then the language model's response will be the clean string, the one that's formatted. All right, so we ran that one. Let's look at these format instructions. So when we use a completion model, we have to put all the instructions in plain text in, in the prompt itself, which is kind of crazy that we have to do this, which is why we'll talk about the um, function calling in a second here. But here's literally the format instructions that Langchain gives the prompt, which is, the output should be marked down, uh, formatted in the following way. And then it says, please enclose your um, response in triple quotes in JSON. So this world of language models, you have to tell it to give you a format like this, which is, which is absolutely mind-blowing. But it's going to insert these instructions right into the final prompt itself. So now what I'm doing is I'm creating my prompt, and I'm saying, you will be given a poorly formatted string from a user reformat it, and make sure all the words are spelled correctly. All right. So now we're going to put in our format instructions, which is what we had above, which is what Langchain supplied for us. And then I'm going to give it the user input. So this is what the user actually says. And in order for me to let it know, hey, I'm done giving you prompt instructions, I put your response and then I put colon so that it knows, OK, now I need to start talking. It's, just, it's a little prompt tip that I've learned over the over the course of doing this. And then we'll create our prompt template. We'll take the user input. And then we'll also input our format instructions, which is how to out, uh, parse the output. And now I'm saying, welcome to California with a bunch of words misspelled. And if we take a look at the final prompt, this is the entire thing that will be sent to the language model. And here is the user's input that was insert there. So it's going to take this welcome to California, and it's going to hopefully give us a good string on, out the other end. So let's pass this to our language model. And I'm doing this by just giving that, that same prompt that we just had. 
And now, as you can see, the language model was, uh, could reason enough that it could give us this model, triple quotes, JSON, couple new lines. And this is just, if I were to even show you, let me split this up here. If I were to show you, we'll do this right here. Um, oh, no, it's not a string. I want to do type. It's just a string. So strings, because uh, language models can't give us um, a structured, um, structured output on its own, we need to do some interpretation of that out the other end here. So we have the string, and now we're going to pass it through Langchain's output parser. And then once we get the output parser, well, then it turns it into a proper Python dictionary for us. So now we have the user's bad string, which is welcome to California. And then now we have the proper one, which is welcome to California. So it trans uh, um, did it for us. But the magic here is getting the structured output back. Now, like I said, that was the older way of doing output parsing. The newer way of doing output parsing that I like a ton is actually piggybacking on OpenAI's function calling that we saw beforehand, which is where you get the structured output for the user query there. Now, the reason why I do this one is because OpenAI, it says nothing that you have to pass that structured output to a function. If you want to use that structured output for another reason, so be it. Go have fun with it. And what's really cool is I like to um, not use uh, Langchain schema or not use the complicated uh, JSON schema that we saw beforehand. I just like to use a Pydantic model. And so here I'm creating a model, which I'm calling a person, and I'm giving it a couple properties. I like this way because it's easier for me to read and it feels a little bit more organized. So I'll give it a property name. I'll say what type it is, and I'll give it a small description. Descriptions are important because this tells the language model what you actually want to get out, uh, extracted from what you're working with here. So let's run this. And then we'll get our model going again. And then here, this is a Langchain, um, this is a Langchain chain, and it's going to be the create structured output chain. So you're going to give it some freeform text. You're going to give it the output that you want on the other side, and then it's going to extract it for you. And so if I say chain.run, I'm going to say, hey, Sally's 13, Joey's 12, loves spinach, Caroline is 10, older than Sally. Awesome. And you can see here what I want is I'm asking for the person. So I just want to know what person came out from here. Let's run this. Cool. So it gets a little confused because there's multiple people that are mentioned here. Sally, Joey, uh, and Caroline. That's not, I meant a single person. I didn't want a whole bunch of people. We get the first age of 13, and we get favorite food of spinach. So this doesn't make a ton of sense for us. But however, what we can do is we can create a second Pydantic model here. And I'm going to call this people. And with people, I want a sequence of the person object, which just means go give me multiple. And so run this. Now let's run it on that same exact thing. And what we get out... What we get out the other side here is we're going to get people, which is the kind of the parent one here, and it's going to be a list of these uh, list of persons. So we'll get Sally, 13, and notice here it says favorite food, none, because you can list it as optional if you want to, which is really nice. And then we get Joey, and then we get Caroline as well. So now all of a sudden we have this freeform text, and now we have a list of structured data that came out the other side. And to re-emphasize this, we can also do enums too. So I'll create another model. I'll do a products parent right here, which is going to be a sequence of products. Because what I want is I want to extract a list of products from a freeform text. So I've seen a ton of people uh, work language model language models on Amazon reviews. A ton of people are doing this right here for that. And so if I put it in the chain and I say chain.run, the CRM in this demo is great. Love the hardware. The microphone's also cool. Love the video editing. Well, we get CRM, we get hardware, and we get video editing. But where's microphone? Well, it wasn't listed in my list here, so it didn't return it back for me, which is cool to see that it'll listen to those instructions for us. Nice. All right, so that is going to be the output parser side, so how you get structured data out the other end. And then next up, we have indexes. So Indexes is the going to be the more complicated world about when we start working with our documents. So documents, again, is the data that you want to bring and put into your prompt. This could be your Notion, your Gmail, your WhatsApp, whatever, whatever you want, really. 
it takes a surprising amount of work to structure all that data. Because if you think about it, let's say you have 10,000 emails or you know, 20,000 Notion docs at your company. Well, how do you get the language model to understand how that's structured? How do you get it to understand what it is? That's when you're going to start doing all the indexes. Um, the first thing that I'll show you here is going to be uh, Langchain's document loaders. So again, on the integrations page that I showed you, I think that they might have... Wow, so it looks like they have 158 different document loaders. This means you can scroll through here. You can go see what, um, what pro what's your favorite program or what text you want to do. And then you can go ahead and just uh, piggyback on top of this. The alternative is that you're going to write your own code to go get this data in there. And you'll have to deal with syncing too. But um, because this is so community driven, there's a lot of people that have done their favorite ones already. And also a little... Um, back strategy with this too, because LangChain got so popular, so many people wanted to develop for them. And so companies would very proactively jump onto the LangChain platform and develop their own integrations for it, which is why you see so many here because uh, LangChain didn't write all these. Nice. So first one I'm going to do is we're going to load up from Hacker News. And so I just give it a Hacker News URL. I say data.load, which means go get the data and go do your thing. And let's check, check out what we have here. So this actually loads up the comments. So on this specific story, which I'm pretty sure is going to be, oops, pretty sure is going to be the LangChain announcement one. Yeah, this is that LangChain announcement one. And we can see here that there's 76 comments that are on it. And here's a sample of what they say. So now all of a sudden, we have Hacker News comments that are put into here. Cool. So that just means we're one step closer to working with Hacker News comments with our language model. All right. Let's see what else we have here. Um, we have books from the Gutenberg Project. Nice. All right. Let's see what book this is. This is going to be one of my favorite authors. It's going to be the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Nice. So all of a sudden, you just had Edgar Allan Poe in your language models now, which is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and load this up, and let's see what we have here. Oh. What do you know? It's the start to my favorite Edgar Allan Poe poem, A Purloined Letter. Who knew? Um, next up, we have uh, just general URLs and web pages. So you can also do a ton of web scraping with LangChain. And one of my favorite use cases is actually web scraping because there's so much un unstructured data out there that needs structuring. And here I'm going to go to Paul Graham's website. I'm going to use the unstructured URL loader, going to load up the data, and we're going to see what prints out on the Paul Graham website. And there it is, ready for us uh, in a language model. The alternative here, here, the alternative here is if, well, I would have been using uh, a bunch of beautiful soup and a lot of messy HTML um, messing around, which I'm glad I don't have to. When you want to load regular URLs right here, nice. But there's kind of a big problem. What if, uh, for example, in the Edgar Allan Poe book, this is a long book, and this is way too much text to put inside of a prompt. Because if we go to, let's see, prompt limits open, open AI. Let's see if we can get an easy one for us here. Token limits. You can see here that they have token limits, meaning you can only put so many tokens in the prompt. And here we go. Depending on the model used, requests can be up to 4,900 or 4,097 tokens. So that means you can't stuff an entire book within your prompt, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, I imagine that that'll be a non-problem in a few years, but it's still a problem for now. And so if you're going to be able to work with this stuff, you need to do what's called splitting or chunking. And so you need to split up your text. And that's the next big topic of LangChain that we're going to learn here, which is when you take your big, long document, and now you're going to cut it up into different chunks. It's a very deep topic, and that's actually one of the use cases we'll see a little bit later. But let's look at a basic use case right here. We're going to look at Paul Graham's worked essay. So this is his longest essay. I'm not sure how long it is, but you can see here that I loaded it up, and now I just have one document. And this represents the one essay that I loaded up. But if I want to get it into small little different chunks, well, then I need to do uh, what LangChain calls a text splitter. And my favorite text splitter that they have is called a recursive character text splitter. And this means that it's going to try to split on new lines, paragraphs basically. So it's going to split by paragraph first. But if that paragraph is too long, well, then it's going to split by uh, period after that. 
And there's a few others that are mixed in, in between there. The point here is, is it'll take the longest possible chunk that it can do based off of your specifications from your, um, from your document here. Now, the two things that you need to specify are going to be chunk size. So this is how big do you want your chunk? And this is in characters. And so if we go back over to the token limits here, we can see that when you're dealing with these language models, one token is about four characters. So if I say 150 characters, well, that's right next to 160. So that's almost 40 tokens. And so what's really cool too, how I like to bring this all the way around, is if you go to OpenAI pricing, you can see how much they charge per thousand characters. So let's not do fine tuned. Let's not do GPT. There we go. So for GPT-4, which is the best model that they have publicly available right now, you can see it's three cents per thousand tokens. And so if I were to take this, if I were to take this one, each chunk to read one of these chunks, let's do 150 divided by thousand times 0.03 to read each one of those chunks would be a fourth of a cent which you can see how this gets added up pretty quickly here. Um, and if I, let me just split this, meaning now I just took that big long document, I cut it into pieces. Now I have 610 different chunks. So if I take that 4 tenths times 610, it'd be $2.44 just to have it read it once, which if you're talking about dollars for anything, for a single API call or for a single call. That's like way too much even to begin with. So the point here is, is you want to be careful <laughs> when you start charging here. Um, and so we have 610 documents. Let's take a look at what these look like. They're just a split up of the chunks of the big long essay that we had beforehand. So before college, two main things I wanted to work on outside of school were writing and programming. Cool. These are the first two um, chunks that we had here. Now, if we wanted to make these chunks longer, well, you just go make the chunk size bigger. So I can say there it's 450. Now the number of chunks that we have goes down because they're bigger and each one of our chunks is bigger. But I'm gonna keep them small just to reemphasize the point. Nice, there's a ton of ways to do text splitting and it's actually very dependent on your domain that you do too because um, breaking on new lines makes sense when you're uh, talking about uh, freeform text like paragraphs, but what if you have markdown? Well, that's probably not the best way to split on Markdown. What if you are splitting on code, like Copilot and Cursor and all those cool IDEs that are doing this stuff? They're not splitting on new lines because you have a bunch of new lines and you may split context where you don't really want to. And that's kind of the boogeyman that happens between all this is, what if you have a really juicy chunk of something, but you split it right in the middle by accident? Well, now it's on two sides, but you really need both together to do something cool. Um, we'll talk about chunking strategies a little bit later in the use cases. Next up, we have vector stores. So beforehand, I had talked about, now that we split our documents, well, how do we get its semantic meaning within a vector? Well, you're gonna use OpenAI's embeddings, and you're gonna turn them into vectors. And what this is gonna look like is you're gonna have your embedding, and then you could have some metadata that comes with that embedding. But so I'm gonna load up Paul Graham's essay one more time, and this is just via the text loader, which is easy because you can just do a text document. I'm gonna use my favorite splitter, the recursive character text splitter, but this time I'm going to do chunk size of a thousand. Now chunk overlap, I think I missed it up above, but this is how much, well, it's what it sounds like. It's how much overlap your chunks have. So if you were to do zero of a chunk overlap, this would mean that your where one chunk ends, the other chunk begins right away. However, if you do chunk overlap, that means that you're starting to overlap them a little bit. Now you're going to have more text, which means more tokens, but your goal or your hope here is that um, your context won't be lost as much. So if you happen to split in an unfortunate place, well, um, chunk overlap will alleviate some of that because you'll carry context across different chunks here. But I'll do 100 here. So this means that my chunk overlap is about 10% of um, my overall chunk size. Then we're going to split the documents, and then we'll get our embeddings model ready. So here we have our embeddings model. And so let's see how many texts we actually have. So from that Paul Graham essay, I have 83 texts. The reason why that's different from up above is because not only did my um, chunk size change, I also added a chunk overlap. And you can see here, if we were to add a bunch of chunk overlap, now we have 149 documents because it moves a little bit less each time down the line and needs more to carry on to it there. All right, so we have our 83 documents. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to get my embeddings list. 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go through each one of these 83 documents, and we're going to call a different model from OpenAI. And this is going to be their Auto model. And I don't specify it here. I must have spec specified it up above. Actually, no. It's right here. It is the default one. There's, of course, there's many different embeddings models. And depending on your domain, you may need a different one. Um, I would encourage you to tinker, experiment, and see if this default one's going to be good enough for you. We'll get our embeddings list. Let's run that. And you can see that was pretty quick, which is nice. And so just those 83. And let's take a look at the samples here. So we have our 83 embeddings. And again, here's a sample of one of those embeddings. Nice. Then what we'll do is we will go on to retrievers. So if vector stores are going to be where you store your embeddings, well, you don't just want a, bit, a big, long list of numbers. You want the documents that are represented by those big, long list of numbers. And retrievers are the way that you can do the coordination between your embeddings and getting those back for your, um, getting back the documents. Let's run this. So again, we're going to split our text. I'm going to load up Paul Graham's essay um, from scratch again. We're going to split our documents. We're going to embed them. But then here's the cool part. So this is a Facebook model, um, F-A-I-S-S, -S, face. And Facebook came out with this. I like this one because it's local. It's easy. You don't have to go get an account anywhere. And it's free, which is cool. It, it works for small use cases. If you're doing production, you may want to explore different ones. But either way, I'm going to store that in uh, just the DB variable there. And then um, um, the way that you do this within LangChain is you call uh, as retriever, dot as retriever. And this tells everything else that, hey, this retriever thing or this database we need to act like a retriever. So it needs to go and get uh, these vectors and documents for us. Let's take a look at what that looks like. It's a vector store retriever. And nothing else really good right there. But then here's where the magic comes around. And this is really the first uh, time we're looking at this here. All the chat your document applications that you see out there in the wild, again, because of the context limit, you can't put all of the data within the prompt. So you need to go selectively get the good stuff. And the good stuff is what is most relevant to the user's query or to the query that you, you may be interested in. So now, if I want to say, what types of things did the author want to build? Could you imagine trying to do that before a language model? Like, how does it, it's almost magic how it happens because it semantically pulls its favorite chunks that we can then go use elsewhere. So if I were to run this, what it's going to do is it's going to convert this user query into an embedding, so into that big long vector list. And then it's going to go to our vector store of 83 vectors. And it's going to say, hey, this user embedding, which one of those 83 is most closely related to this user embedding? And it, there's many ways to do that. You can do it through Euclidean distance. You can do it through cosine similarity. There's a bunch of them out there. You get creative. But either way, you get the um, vectors that are most similar to that. Then the cool part is those documents you then go put in your prompt. And then you have the language model go answer this question based off those documents. So what I have here is I have those relevant documents stored in this document um, variable. Let's run this. So now here are the chunks that are most relevant to the user's query. What type of things did the author want to build? He says, I just wanted to build things, but to build things uh, that would last. Cool. And he talks about some computer science stuff. So the author wanted to build things that would last. Now, you can't just return this to the user because you don't want the user to read that. The really, really cool part about how all this coordination is happening is you take these documents that have been returned by the language model, and you put that in the prompt, and you go answer for it. Uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and do that right now just to show you um, while we're at it, because I think that would be pretty cool to look at. Beautiful. So if we were to let's do a chat one though. So if we're to take this, let's go down to the bottom with it. Now we're doing some beautiful. So here are the here are the docs that were listed for it. So wh what would be really cool is if I were to take this user's query that they just said, what types of things did the author want to build? And I'm just going to replace it into this human message right here. But now I need to take this. And I'm doing this manually. Of course, you'll do this um, via regular code when you're doing it for real. But I'm going to take this, and I'm going to say, you are a helpful AI bot that answers a user's 
query. And then what I'm going to do here is relevant context. And then I'll just paste in the relevant context. Now, of course, that looks messy. Let's turn this into three. Beautiful. So now we have the relevant context, which I just pasted in there. And now we have the thing, what types of things that the author want to build. So it'll take that and it'll give us the natural language response out. So the author wanted to build things that would last. And then it gets a little verbose here. We can prompt engineer that away if we needed to. Um, this is the part that you would return to the user. And so that was kind of the magic on how it happens is you go get your relevant docs, you throw those relevant docs into the prompt itself with the user's question, and then you get the natural language response back out the other side. Let me delete that one. Nice. Now, the other big topic within um, LangChain as well is going to be the concept around memory. Now, of course, there's so many chat models that are happening out there right now. How do you keep track of what the user said last week or maybe just a few sessions ago? And so LangChain helps with memory with that. And they have chat message history. And so here, for example, we're doing, we're creating our chat model again. And then we're going to create a history model or history object, which is our chat message history. I'm going to add a message. The AI didn't really say this, but I'm just adding it synthetically. So you can go ahead and add whatever you want. I'm going to add the user message. What is the capital of France? We can take a look at the actual history that we have here. So this is just a list of messages that we can go and then use later. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that history of messages and we're going to pass that to our language model. Cool. Capital of France is Paris. Makes sense. And then we're going to add this to our history. We're going to add the response that the AI gave us back. And now, and let's print that out one more time. The capital of France is Paris. Nice. So that is chat history. Chat history gets very complicated very quickly. Um, because remember, again, because you can't put everything into the context window, you might need to selectively um, be picky about which chat messages you reference when you are having your conversation. And that's where it gets complicated. But we won't jump into that quite yet. Nice. So the next big part about what we're going to talk about is chains. Now, up until this point, we've talked a lot about the nuts and the bolts, and it might have been a little bit dry, but thank you for bearing with me on this. This is where we start to see some cool work start to happen for us. All right? Now, I always, whenever I teach a subject, I like to start with the, um, with the base case, which is almost like the V0. Let's start at the very beginning so we're all aligned on how this works, and then let's get more complicated from there. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create what's called a sequential chain. Now, a sequential chain is basically just two chains that happen right after each other. So do this one, and then go do this one. Now, this chain, what it happens to be is the user is going to give its location. And what I'm telling the language model is, your job is to come up with a classic dish from the area that a user suggests. All right, then we have the user's location, and then now we have the language model's response. I'm going to put that into a prompt template, so I can insert uh, variables into it later. And then I'm going to put that prompt template into a, a very simple LLM chain, which is just a, um, a structure that LangChain uses for, to make simple chains. I'm going to pass in the language model. I'm going to pass in our prompt template. Cool. All right. Given a meal. Now, I start this because the goal from up above is the output will be a classic dish from that area. So given a meal, give a short and simple recipe on how to make that dish at home. And then here we're going to pass in the user meal. Now, this user's meal, this will be the output from the very first prompt that we did. Now, you may be saying, well, Greg, why don't you just put these two things in here at the same time? Why do you have to split them up into two? Well, one of the secrets about language models, and this is outside of LangChain, but they're not very good at a large set of instructions all at once. I'm not going to ask the language model to do 10 things for me all at once or try to take 10 different steps because, well, it gets lost along the way. You could try to help it out by saying, think out loud. But then, even then, you're, you're kind of gambling a little bit. Any chance you get to split up a language model tasks into multiple pieces, and you can afford the latency, I highly suggest doing, which is why we're doing this here. So given a meal, give a short recipe. Nice. We're going to load that up into another meal chain, and we have our location chain. Now, our, our overall chain is going to be our simple sequential chain, which means just do two things right after each other, and the chains we're going to do the location chain, and then the meal chain. Now, one of the cool things that I like about uh, LangChain is they have this option for ver <clears throat> verbose equals true. Now, verbose is what it sounds like. 
It means that it's going to show you a bit more information than you may want, but this helps show what's happening in the background because once you start getting into chains, well, then all of a sudden you have a bunch of API calls that are happening and you may not know exactly which ones they are. Up until now, it's been kind of what you see is what you get, but uh, chains make that a little bit different. So I'm going to say verbose equals true. And then I'm going to input Rome, which if we go up to the top here, this is what the user location is going to be up above. So let's take that and let's run that. So now with verbose equals true, you can start to see what the language model is thinking about and how it's thinking. So it first said, all right, it wants to tell us how to make car uh, carbonara. Awesome. And then it's going to give us the ingredients uh, to make that, which is the instructions. And it's a different color because this is the second chain that we went through. So now it finished the chain, which is really nice. We can see that. And I find that I didn't actually look at it here. So let's look at the output about what this is. And let's actually print this. And we can see that we get the actual the same output from here. Nice. That's the sequential chain. That's the easy stuff. But now let's go into more of the magic about what makes Langchain pretty cool to work with. So they take a lot of the common use cases that a lot of folks are doing, and they make uh, an abstraction for them. That makes it really simple for us. So we're going to take another Polygram essay here, but the goal this time is we want to create a summary of this Polygram essay. And now if I were to actually, let's go to Polygram, and this essay that we want to do is a, it's called Disk. And I just want to see how long disk is and just show you what it looks like. I'm just going to click on one and let's go disk. Nice. So this disk, all right, so this one's not so bad. This one's pretty short. You know, I want to take a longer one because let's get, let's see, let's get a different one here. He's talking about alien truths here. That's too short still. He's talking about what I've learned from users. All right, this one's good. This one's a little bit longer here. So I'm going to take this one and let's see if we can pop that one in. Nice. So then I'm going to load up Paul Graham's essay. I'm going to do my recursive character text splitter, which means we're going to take that big long essay and we're going to split up into chunks. We're going to actually do the splitting here. And then we're going to do, in fact, let's just run that first. Let's split this up for us. Cool. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call one of Langchain's cool abstractions called load summarize chain. Now, what load summarize chain does is there's a prompt in the background that Langchain manages that is really good at summarizing documents. So we're going to take Paul Graham's big long essay and we're going to do some summarization for us here. And th the way that we're going to do that summarization is we're going to do chain type map reduce. So you may be like, well, hey, Greg, that essay is way too long. How are you going to summarize that whole thing? Well, Langchain has a couple really cool what they call chain types. And these chain types are different ways for you to process data that's longer than your context window. So I actually wanted to show you just very briefly on how this one looks. This is for a different, um, this is for a different uh, context, but it'll, it's all the same regardless. Like I said beforehand, OpenAI's context limit is 4K, right? But let's say that you have a PDF that's 8,000 tokens. Well, what the heck do you do with it, right? Especially if you want to summarize it. Well, what you do, the first thing that we talked about is we're going to chunk this thing up. We're going to make it into smaller pieces that are more manageable that we can actually put into the language model. Cool. Well, then what we're going to do is, let's just say that we have one, two, three, four different chunks right here. Well, with those four chunks, we want to go get a summary of those four chunks. So we're going to give it a, the prompt is going to be the instructions, which is go get a summary. And then the context here is going to be the actual text that's from your longer document. Then, after that, we're going to get a summary of each chunk. So now we have four summaries, and these are smaller summaries. And the reason why this one works is because these chunks are smaller, they can actually fit within the prompt window. And then the final step that we do is we go get a summary of the summaries. And then you get your final summary. Now, you may be like, well, hey, Greg, is there going to be any information loss on this one? And the unfortunate matter is, yes, there will be a little bit. It's the way that it goes with these language models in the current day and age. It won't be a problem forever because this is a big problem and people don't like this one, but there are also many ways to get around this as well. So um, if anybody is curious to talking about that more, find me afterwards. Cool, so that's the MapReduce. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna call chain type MapReduce and I'm gonna say verbose equals true. And I hope this one's not too long, but you know, I wanna make this, I wanna reduce the amount of chunks that we have because I don't want this to take forever. Let's see how many texts we actually have. 
we have 20. So this means that it would make 20 summaries of 20 chunks. It's way, it's way too much. Um, I'm gonna actually probably triple this size. So now it's only seven. Let's go just let's get a little bit more greedy. Now you may say, well, Greg, why don't you just make it as big as possible that it could do? Well, the other unfortunate part is the more data you put into the prompt, the less confident you can be that you will not have information loss. So basically, if you want a dense summary, it's good to do little uh, summaries on little chunks rather than give it as much as you can and ask it for a summary there. All right, so now we just have six chunks. So now what I'll do is we'll go ahead and run this. And because I set verbose equals true, we can see what's happening in the background. So here's the actual prompt that Langchain made for us. Write a concise summary of the following. And then it gives it, and then it gives it the text. Yeah, that looks, that looks good still. Nice, okay. Um, and then here's the prompt after the formatting. So here's write a concise summary of the following. Here's the big long text. So if we were to count these, we have, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, cool. And then there's seven there, finish that chain. All right, so here's the cool part. So there was six of those first summaries that we had. Now, if we take a look at the last call, this is the reduce call. This is where you get a summary of the summaries. So now what Langchain has done for us underneath the covers is it's put all those summaries into the prompt for us. So here's summary one, two, three, four, five, and six. And what it asked it, the language model to do is write a concise summary of the following. We go down all the way to the bottom. And so now, I wish there was more, or actually there, there's no line breaks. I wish there was a few more line breaks in this, but I'm getting picky. But now we just had this text that was way too long to get a summary in the first place of it. And Langchain was able to split that up for us go get the summaries and then go get the summaries of the summaries. And now we have something out the other end for it. So when you think about all those applications that are summarizing code bases, or if you're going to be summarizing a book, these are the types of workarounds that we have to do today for it. Um, another big question you may ask is, well, Greg, what about all those context limits that are like a hundred thousand now or like a million? Yeah, those will, get, those will get better for them. But the other unfortunate truth too is, like I said, the more information you put in there, the more chance of information loss you have on there. So if you go and use a model that uses 100K token limits, well, make sure to benchmark it and make sure you're still getting what you need out of it because I'm still a little skeptical on it. <laughs> nice. All right, let's finish up with uh, the last of the Langchain fundamentals. And we'll probably take a break after this one just because it's so close to our time here. So now we're going on to the topic of agents, and I save agents for last because these are the most complicated, uh, I'll call it really like a superstructure of language models. And it's pretty wild to think that we started up at the very top with a simple string, text in, text out, and now we're all the way down at the bottom uh, talking about uh, agents. So agents are going to be the things that are going to go do things out in the world. Now there's a lot of uh, debate about the definition of an agent, which is funny because we still haven't agreed on terminology yet in the language model world. It's okay, it's the way it goes. The way that I think about agents is I think about uh, decision making. I think about reasoning. I think about some entity, it could be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be, that needs to make a decision. And once that decision is made, then it goes down another path. So think of it, well, the way that I think about it is like an if statement or a case statement but it takes actual reasoning and it doesn't have a directly logical flow like you may want it to. There's a few vocabulary words with agents. So within agents, there's the agent. This is the language model that's actually driving the decision making. And then there's tools. This is pretty cool here because if you're gonna combine, if you're gonna combine the uh, function calling that we had beforehand with decision making, well, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Can I tell the language model to decide what function it should take? Oh wait, let me give it access to an API and it knows how to use that API and it's gonna make decision for, for us. So when you, talk, when you hear a lot about the hype about AI, it's really around agents and like where it's starting from here. The hype is way, way overblown, but the fundamentals are really, really cool here. So tools are gonna to be the things that you give the agent access to. This could be the weather API. This could be to make a change within a user's settings. This could be Slack 
hey, if something happens and you think it's cool, send me a, a Slack DM. And then a toolkit is simply going to be a collection of tools. It's nothing too complicated there. All right, let's run this. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a tool. And I'm going to use a tool, the SERP API tool. This just goes and gets Google um, search results for us. Uh, I, this is a free product, but you have to go get an API key. But load up my API key here. And I'm going to load up my tools for this agent. And I'm going to load up the SERP API tool. And this is a tool that Langchain already knows about in there. I'm going to pass in my language model. And I'm going to pass in my API key. Cool. Now we made our toolkit. And now I'm going to initialize the agent. I'm going to give it the toolkit, which is the way that it knows which tools it has access to. I'm going to pass it the language model, which is uh, you know, the thing that's going to actually do the reasoning for us. And then you're going to tell it what type of agent you want it to be. And as we'll see in a second here, there's a lot of different agent frameworks. And there's more frameworks coming out all the time. One of the early popular ones is going to be the React agent. And we'll see about what that looks like in just a second here and how it works. But we're going to use Langchain's zero-shot zero reaction. A lot of people are making their own custom agents right now. We're going to say verbose equals true, so we can see what happens in the background. And we're going to return intermediate steps, and so we can see more logging about what's happening here. All right, so we just made our agent. And I just stuffed it in this agent variable. And now I'm going to call on the agent variable. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say for the input to the agent, what was the first album of the band that Natalie Bergman is a part of? All right, Greg, that doesn't seem too simple, or it doesn't seem too hard. Now, if you were to create a program to complete just this query, all right, sure. Yeah, you can go mess around. You can probably fi figure out a pretty clean way to do it. But the purpose here is you have a free form query here. You don't know what this is going to be. And there's multiple steps that need to be taken here. Not only do you need to figure out which band Natalie Bergman is a part of, but then you need to go and figure out what is the album that she is a part of too. So there's a little bit of reasoning here. And if I had given multiple tools, well, then it would need to decide, well, which tool is best for my job right now? Um, we just have one tool that's listed here. So let's look at what this output actually looks like. So now Langchain is entering the agent executor class, which is how the agent's going to go start uh, working. And I'm going to run through this slowly and apologize. I'm going to kind of tease what's happening here, but I don't want to spoil it. You should try to find out which band Natalie Bergman is a part of. This is what the language model thought because it heard the query, it knew what, knew what tools it had, and um, that's, what, that's, that's what it was thinking. And then the action that it wanted to do was search. And the action that search, this is a tool, like a, like a function, the search is the SERP API. This is where it goes and goes and finds that, uh, finds that information. The action input is going to be, what query did you give the search tool? And it gave the search tool, Natalie Bergman Band. All right, cool. So that's the first step for us. And then the observation is going to be what the response is from that tool itself. So we just went from me talking to a language model, text in, text out. Now it's talking to an API. That's really cool. So now we have this big, long, complicated string of what Natalie Bergman is, or what band she's a part of. OK, cool. I should look, and what it found in there, because it wants to find what band, and Mm, maybe one of you all see it. I don't see it, but oh, there it is. It was right on, it's always underneath your mouse, but there it is. So it, now it knows that it's part of the Wild Bell band. Cool. Its next thought is I should look for the name of the band Wild Bell. Cool. It looks into it, finds the Wild Bell band. I should look for the name of the first album by Wild Bell. Cool. And it sees that the first, uh, the band, the album's name is uh, Isles. I know now, I know the final answer. So the other really cool thing that's happening here, which isn't, isn't talked about explicitly, is it knew when it was done. So there was an undetermined amount of steps that it needed to go do in order to find this answer. And it looked like it executed three of them and it knew when to stop, which is really, really, really cool because that's another unstructured freeform piece here. So it knows the final answer and it says, Isles, cool. And we look at Wild Bell. And it doesn't have uh, <laughs> doesn't it doesn't have the name of the band on here. But that's what we're going to end with for part one here. Now, if I were to go back, oh, it looks like I already closed out my thing. If I'm going to go back, 
So we just, we just talked about a lot. We talked about model types. We talked about prompts, output parsers, doc loaders, embeddings, vector stores, chains, memories, agents, a whole bunch of good stuff here. Now, we're going to take a break here, and let's still go to the 315 just to give everybody uh, plenty of time to go do whatever you need to do. But then we're going to come back, and the cool part that we're going to do is now we're going to start talking about use cases. Now, the agent at the very end there, that was a simple way of getting some cool information out. I want to take this to the workplace. We're going to talk about how you do really structured extraction, uh, extraction and tagging. So if you have a bunch of input data from a user, how, what, you, what you can do for it. We're also going to talk about simple Q&A. So I talked a little bit about it when I was copying and pasting here, but now we're actually going to build a little chat bot and we're going to do simple Q&A. We're going to do pretty complicated Q&A too, which is going to be really nice. And then I'm also going to talk about much deeper summarization as well. And if we have time, we'll talk about topic modeling and Streamlit apps. So. Thank you very much. We'll see you all back here at 3.15. Welcome back. And thank you to everyone who is a recurring customer here. Round two. I wasn't sure how many people would come back, but I'm actually I'm very happy with this number. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to be going over a couple of things here. So now this is the use cases portion of this uh, workshop, if you will. And in the part one, we learned all the nuts and the bolts. It's a little bit dry because you got to learn those to figure out how to do the cool stuff. Well, this part two is the cool stuff. And so we're going to go through four pretty big areas. And um, well, we'll go through four pretty big areas. The first one we're going to look at is summarization. So oh, Greg, how cool could summarization be? Well, we're going to show you five different levels of summarization that tackle different aspects of problems I know you're going to run into. So uh, hopefully that'll help out there. And then we're going to build a simple Q&A bot, or I'm going to build one up here. Now, I want to um, set a public service announcement. There is also a Q&A builder uh, workshop, hands-on workshop, happening today at 4.50. So I think it's 20 minutes after the end of this talk. If you want to bring your laptop and go build your own bot, um, there's another session later today on that. But I'll show you the basics and overview of it. And then the third topic we're going to talk about is advanced retrieval. So we talked a little bit about simple retrieval, which is when you get documents that may be similar, but it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. And different domains require different types of retrieval, which it will get exciting for us. And then the last one we'll look at is extraction and tagging. So this is when you extract structured data out of unstructured data, or you may tag a piece of freeform text. Um, I'll show you that in a bit there. And if we still have time, then we'll do some topic modeling and we'll go even further with a Streamlit app. Now, before we jump into it, I do want to call out. I now have a sticky note down there at the bottom, bottom right. If anybody has any questions, rather than raise your hand, feel free to submit on that Google form. I'll be checking my phone after each one just in case there's any hot topics we need to desperately cover for that section. You guys ready? <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. So the very first use case we're going to look at is going to be five levels of summarization, novice, to expert. So again, I like to start at almost like the V0, which is the very simple use case about summarizing, or any, any topic really. So let's zoom in here. And so again, we'll load in our API keys. And now we're going to create, we're on level one. So we want to do some summarization over a piece of text. Now the way I laid this out here is there's five different levels. And I want to know how do, how do you summarize a couple sentences, a couple paragraphs, a couple pages, an entire book, and then the wild card last one, an unknown amount of text. Let's go check that one out. So level one here, we want to summarize just a couple sentences. So I have, let's import our model. Great. So now I have a prompt. And I'm going to say, very simply, this is just to summarize a couple sentences. V1, please provide me a summary of the following text. And then I copied and pasted a complicated Wikipedia entry for philosophy. I could barely keep my eye. I, couldn't follow it, so I was like, all right, this will be a good candidate for us. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to store this string. Now, keep in mind, this is just a simple string here in the prompt variable. And I first want to see how many tokens is this prompt. So um, this piece of text right here. And let's print out how many tokens. And I already see there's a spoiler right there. So we're going to run. We're going to clear some output so we don't get those spoilers. Let's go through that. All right, cool, 100, 121 tokens. Uh, that's not too many, because remember on the OpenAI pricing, they price them in terms of thousands of tokens. And I think that OpenAI's pricing was $0.03 cents USD per thousand tokens. So this would be a third, uh, 
three tenths of a cent ish just for the input side of, and you know, while I'm on that topic, let's, let's talk about that just very briefly. Um, how OpenAI does their pricing. And this is how I've seen other models do their pricing too. So they give two pricing numbers here. First is the input tokens. These are tokens that you're asking them to read. So since that piece of text that I just had, had 121 tokens, well, automatically I'm asking them to read that, just that piece of text. It'll be three tenths of a cent. Okay. Now the output, the fancy word for the output is called inference. So how much do they charge for inference? Well, they charge double per thousand tokens. So if you ask them for a short response, that'll be cheaper than asking them for a much longer response. People may ask, well, Greg, can we use other models? Totally. Langchain makes it really easy for you to supply your own hosted model, your cloud provider's model, whoever's model you want, or you can use another open AI model. So if we go down to GPT 3.5 turbo, which is a less powerful model, but that makes it quicker and um, well, less reasoning power much less price. I think this is something like less than a 10th of the price, like a 20th of the price. So it, people ask what Greg, <clears throat> what models should I use? It's really application specific. If you have a really, really simple task, well then I, I go to GPT 3.5, but if you need something with large reasoning or more complicated, well then you start with 3.5, see how it goes. It doesn't go well. You go up to four. All right. So that's, that's on the pricing side. So we'll get charged 121 uh, tokens for that. Cool. Now I want to actually put this prompt through my language model and I'll just call language model in the prompt, store it in the output. Let's print the output. All right. So it puts it into more relatively easier to understand English on there. Philosophy is a systematized study of general and fundamental questions about the existence. Cool. But there's something still wrong about this summary for me. I want to edit it just a little bit more and I'm saying, please provide a summary of the following text. But this time, provide your manner in a way that a five-year-old would understand, because I need it simple. So now, now this is my new prompt. Let's see how many tokens we have. 137, not much more, just a few more. And then let's go ahead and print this output. Philosophy is about asking questions and trying to figure out the answers. That's a lot easier for me to understand. Awesome. Well, that's the simple way to do it. That's when we can hold our... Um, what we want summarized, we can hold it just in a basic prompt. Let's move on to level two. So level two, now we have a couple paragraphs that we want to summarize. All right, so it's a little bit longer. I copied and pasted those last sentences. I can't copy and paste all day long. I don't want to do that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to load up a series of Paul Graham essays. And we have two of them here. One of them is uh, Get Ideas and the other one is Noob. So let's open these. We have our list here of essays. And now let's see what a sample of these essays look like. And we're just printing the first 300 characters. And so this isn't how long they totally are, but here are two essays, just so you believe me here. And then let's go through these. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a prompt template because remember last time prompt templates uh, help us to put dynamic text within another prompt. And I'm going to give it the same thing I had before. Please write a one sentence summary of the following text, and then I'll give it an essay. Run through that. Okay, cool. But now here's where the magic happens, and I'm doing this more manually so that we can really spell it out. Four essays in essays. Remember, there's only two of them. So for each essay, we're going to go through each one. I'm going to get the actual prompt, and we're going to supply the actual essay to the prompt. So this time, instead of just the token placeholder, we'll have the actual essay itself. I'm going to get the number of tokens so we can see how much that was. And then I'm going to get the summary. We'll go ahead and run that. So the first prompt, or the first one, had 205 tokens super simple uh, summary for us, which is really nice. In fact, that's so simple. I wonder if I told it, yeah, a one sentence summary. So I put this in here on purpose because we've done vanilla summaries, which is still kind of verbose. We've done explain it like I'm five summaries and we've done one sentence summaries here. So when in doubt, if you don't get what you want out of the gate, tinker with the prompt and the output format and you'll get something hopefully a little closer to what you're looking for. So one sentence summary and another one sentence summary. One thing I've noticed a ton too, is if I ask it for a one sentence summary, sometimes it'll be a little long. So you may need to say a, one, a short one sentence summary. Um, cool. Well, that's level two. That's how you do, that's how you summarize a couple of paragraphs there. Now let's say we want to do a couple pages. All right. Well, that one's a little bit longer and those paragraphs we had beforehand, we could throw those right into the prompt. But as we saw in the last 
session here. Well, Paul Graham's startup idea is one. His is pretty long here. Let's see how many tokens this is. So this is 50, uh, 9,500 tokens. And as we saw beforehand, GPT-4 has the context limit of 8,000 tokens. And 3.5, 3, I think it's 4,000 tokens, but then there's a bigger one that can give you more. But either way, let's assume that this is way too big for us to put into our context window here. And it looks like I put that in. Good documentation. Um, next thing I'm going to do is we need to go and split this up. And so I talked about beforehand the map reduce method. To quickly go over that one more time here, I just want to show you what that looks like. What we're going to do here is we have, that, we have a problem where OpenAI's token limit is 4K tokens, but our document is now it's 9,500. What we're going to do is we're going to split this thing up into four different chunks. And with those chunks, we're going to go ask it for a summary of each one of those. Because these chunks, well, that smaller piece, that can fit in the prompt. And then once we get those summaries, we're going to get a summary of the summaries. Now, some people ask, well, Greg, what if I have so many summaries that those many summaries don't fit in the prompt already? Well, then you got to map reduce it again. And then you just keep on going down from there. All right. So there's that. And so here's our recursive character text splitter. And here's where I tell it what I want you to split on. And so first, it's a double new line, and then it's a single new line. Chunk size, I want 10,000, which is pretty good, pretty big. And remember, this is number of characters. So this is roughly uh, 2,500 tokens. And we're going to have a chunk overlap of 5%. To be honest, I haven't really found a best practice for this yet. I do around 10% if I'm doing it. But again, tinker if you need to. We'll split this up. <clears throat> Let's see how many docs we have. And so now we have five documents. So beforehand, we only loaded one essay. But now we have that essay split into five different pieces. And the first um, chunk has uh, about 2,000 tokens. So another question you may ask is, well, hey, Greg, I thought you said 10,000 characters, which is like 2,500 tokens. But this one only has 2,000, which is kind of off. Well. Per OpenAI, it's not exactly every four words, or every one token is four characters. It, it doesn't always work out like that. So some, 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 some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. And so <clears throat> don't get caught up if it's not the exact same number here. All right, so we run that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to load our summarized chain. Now what I want to do first is I want to show you one other chain type before we get into this one. I want to do, I want to do stuff. Now, what stuff means, <clears throat> excuse me, what stuff means is it's going to take all of the essays that we had and it's going to try to stuff it into the prompt, meaning it doesn't know MapReduce, it doesn't know Refine, it just tries to stuff it in there. And, let, and then, as I was expecting, we get an error. And if we check out the error down at the bottom, this model's maximum context length is 4,000. You gave us 9,800. Yep, OK, so that's why it's not going to work. The reason why I showed you that one is because you may want stuff if you have um, an easy application later where you don't run into this problem. But for this one, I want to do MapReduce. And I actually want to do verbose equals true. And then let's do this one more time. OK, so now we get some output. Let's scroll to the top here. Oh, boy. OK, so now we're entering a MapReduce document chain. We're going to write a concise summary. Then here's the first chunk that we gave it. OK, cool. There's one. Keep it going. This is a big chunk. There's number two. Keep it going. There's chunk two. Chunk three. Come on now. Chunk four. So now that there's four, actually, there's five total. OK, there's five. And we go all the way down to the bottom. And now here, what we have is we have a reduce step, which is just a regular LLM chain. And we have the summaries of those five chunks. So now we have one summary, two summary, three summary, four, and five. So then what we ask the language model is, hey, can you give us a summary of the summaries? And then what it does is it gives us the output. And so now we have a nice, relatively concise summary of Paul Graham's entire essay, which I think is really cool here. So this is a way that you got to work around it. Now, there's another type of chain I'll show you very briefly. It's called the refine chain. And refine is just another method. Uh, there's no right answer for when to use it. You'll just have to figure it out for what works for your use case. What it does is it chunks up the document, but it's going to take the first chunk, and it's going to ask for a summary of that first chunk. That's call number one. OK. Then what it's going to do is it wants to refine that summary. So it's going to go take chunk number two, 
And it's going to say, hey, here's the summary you already gave me. Here's additional context from chunk number two. Should you change the summary that you've made already? And it's going to refine that summary. I think the exact language is, can you refine it? And then it's going to do that same thing for whatever summary number you want. So this can go on forever. And it's going to continually refine, 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 refine. I don't always love this message or love this one because I find that sometimes the context that gets pulled out of summary one loses itself a little bit if you get too far down the line. If you try doing this 20 times in a row, you know, who knows what you're going to get at the other end. It's like a game of telephone sometimes. Um, so that's the refine method. And then you get your final summary at the very end of that. Let's go ahead and run this. Um, and the other unfortunate part about refine is you can't, um, can't run in parallel. When you do MapReduce, you can run all these at the same time. But with refine, you're going sequentially here. So it's, it, again, it's up to you for that. Let's see refine. And let's see the actual language that LangChain uses for this in the prompt. <clears throat> so write a, <clears throat> write a concise summary of the following. Okay, So that's the first one. Then let's go down. Okay, all right, here we go. This is where it gets kind of tricky. And this is why LangChain is cool and helps you out with this. Your job is to produce a final summary. We have provided a summary up to an existing certain point. And then here's the summary it got from chunk one. <laughs> we now have the opportunity to refine the existing summary. There's the refine, only if needed, with some more context below. And then it gives it all the context below. So this is a massive prompt, and there's kind of a lot going on here. But, you know, spoiler, we get down to the bottom, and we can see what the output is. It looks like it's a much longer one because it kept on adding to it. But if you print that out. <coughs> now, another question you may ask is, well, Greg, how do we know which summary is better? And the, <coughs> the answer to that one is, well, it's pretty tough to know which one's better without looking at it with a human. There's a huge topic of evaluations, which we didn't go over for this one. That's an another topic in LangChain. But evaluation should, in theory, help you evaluate how good uh, an output from a language model is. It's really tough to know which summary is better. Now, Salesforce just came out with something, I think it was called like chain of density summarization or something like that, and they had a pretty cool method for it. But if you want to know which one's better, I suggest just looking at it. And then after you've done that, then try to build a prompt, which is going to tell you which summary is better. Nice. Um, so that summary that we had up above is cool, but I'm more of a bullet point person. I'm kind of a spreadsheet guy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to do my own custom MapReduce because we couldn't see the, ch uh, we couldn't see the prompts that LangChain was using beforehand because they're all uh, abstracted away with the chain. I'm going to write my own custom one. So for my map prompt, I'm going to say write a concise summary. OK, cool, which is the same, I think, thing that LangChain has. But for the second one, I'm going to say, uh, write me in bullet points. Give me a bullet point summary so I can then affect the output that I want from it. I'm going to load the summarize chain, but this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify the two prompt templates that I made beforehand for my map and for my combined as well. I won't do verbose equals true here because that will just kind of muddy it up and you'll see what it says anyway. So let's let that run. And we're on our map reduce chain. So it's going through all those chunks. It's creating the summaries of those chunks. And then it's going to give me the final reduce, or then it's going to run that final summaries through my um, combined prompt there. And let's get this out. And then there's our bullet point summary now, which is pretty nice. I find that sometimes the language model will pick its own bullet points. And so if you have a format you like, you'll have to specify. Sometimes it's dashes. Sometimes it's asterisk, asterisks. It goes all over the place. Um, cool. <clears throat> so this next method is level four. This is how you summarize an entire book. And this is actually a method that I came up with tinkering around myself because I thought, man, I don't want to throw, well, I guess let me just show you here. So there's this book that I really like called Into Thin Air, which is about the Everest disaster. I believe it was 1998. <clears throat> and if we take a look at how many tokens this book has, <clears throat> it's doing all the loading right now, which is, uh, why it's taken so long. There we go. This book has 140,000 tokens in it. So if GPT-4 charges three cents, 
times per thousand, it would cost $4.20 just to like read it once. And that's why I don't want to do MapReduce because that's four bucks you'd, you'd be spending going all the way down and that's just one book. You know, what if you got a whole bunch of them? And so I thought to myself, well, what's the best way to get a summary of a whole book? And the method I came up with was, I, I made up a name for it. I don't even know if it, it was out there. I called it BVR, which stands for um, Best Vector Representation. And what that means is, is I want to chunk up the entire book, right? So 140,000 characters or tokens, I want to chunk that up into much smaller pieces. And so what I did was, let's just go ahead and chunk this up here and I'll show you what, why this is cool. So I chunked it up into 78 different documents. If you were to do this the normal way, you would do MapReduce down those 78 documents, but then you're going through all 140,000 tokens. You don't want to do that. So I asked myself, how could you get a subset of those documents which best represents what the book is about. And what I mean by that is, in theory, are there, say, 10 documents that are critical sections of the book that kind of describe what it's about? And then could I do MapReduce on those 10 instead? Which is still a little expensive, but it's not 78 expensive. And well, I was like, well, I want to explore this. I want to see if we can do it here. And so the method that I came up with is, well, we have these things called vectors. So let's go with our 78 documents and let's go get vectors for them all. And let me just show you just so we can all, oh, that's too much. Oh, let's look at the first one. So we have our vector. So here's one vector from one of the chunks. It's 1500 long, so it's huge. Doesn't make any sense to me. And what I want to do here, <coughs> it's making me think of my old clustering days. I want to cluster these vectors together. Because then what I think will happen, this is from, again, from my old data science days, I'll be able to find different clusters of vectors. And my hypothesis is that those clusters will represent different sections of the book. So say one cluster could be in a, a fictitious book. It's all about the childhood. Another cluster is all about their time in the mountains because it's all mountain related languages all together. And so I want to create those clusters because then what I want to do is I want to pick and you can see here I specify, oh, that's so annoying. <clears throat> I know what happens with this one. I run into problems with uh, face. And so I actually want to use chroma instead. If you ever run into problems with this vector store, chroma is another great alternative. And let me go ahead and let me run all above. And we'll run that. Beautiful. So what I'm going to do while that's running for us, um, I'm going to cluster those 78 different chunks. I want to cluster those into 11 different uh, groups, if you will. Now, the cool part about those 11 different groups is, in theory, those are 11 different parts of the book. Now, how do you get the number of groups? This is an age-old question. There's a few uh, tricky ways to do this, but this was just through trial and error for myself. <clears throat> so now that we have those 11 groups, what I want to do is I want to pick a sample vector from each one of those 11 groups. <clears throat> So what's cool is now we'll have 11 vectors, which in theory represent 11 different parts of the book. And then we'll go ahead and we'll do MapReduce on those, <clears throat> those 11 different vectors there. So let's see where we're getting caught up here. It's probably loading, oh, there we go. Loading up, loading up. Okay, now we're getting our vectors here. Fingers crossed, that's gonna fix the problem for us. We're gonna cluster Hmm. I'm not happy with that. Either way, <clears throat> well, let me explain what's going on here, and then we'll just have to, unfortunately, um, let's see. Uh, I'll show you what's cool about this, because I think that there actually is one. How would you say? <laughs> That's one of my YouTube videos. Um, I think there actually is a pretty cool chart that comes from here. So what ended up happening was <clears throat> I did... Uh, dimensionality reduction on these because we're at 1500, uh, uh, 1500 length vectors. I wanted to chart them because whenever you do a clustering exercise, you got to chart it. It looks too cool to, to not chart. And this is the chart that came out about it. And so I did uh, dimensionality reduction down to two, two uh, vectors here or two dimensions. Different, different colors represent different clusters. 
So there's a little green cluster right here. There's a yellow one. There's a light green. There's a blue, you know, all these. And it, the first hint that I knew that this might be okay was that similar colors were right next to each other. So yes, there is some grouping with this, which is really nice. So what I want to do next is I want to pull out the, a single vector from each one of these clusters. So now I only have 11. And I won't do this, I won't go through it all because the code's not working, but spoiler, what we end up getting is I then asked for a summary of those different documents that are, have been cherry picked. So now all of a sudden we have summaries of those summaries. It's the same MapReduce thing. And then I go ahead and I ask, can you give me a summary of the summaries? Um, and there we go. We get a, it's a pretty long summary, which I'm actually okay with because think about how much context there is in an entire book. I'm okay with a long summary, and that is what ended up coming out when the code was working, but I'll make sure that fixes before it goes out. <clears throat> so then let's try to skip that part, and we'll go on to level five here. <clears throat> All right, level five is when you try to summarize an unknown amount of text. Now, this one was a little hairy, and I like this one as number five because it's unbounded, and this is where we need the agent to come through here. So let's go ahead and let's run this, and you can see here, Oh yeah, because we got to restart here. Let's do that. Let's go down. May still give us a hard time. All right, let's see if this works for us here. And so the tool that I'm going to give this agent here is I'm going to go query Wikipedia. And what I'm going to ask for, or if I got to initialize it in a toolkit, which is just a single tool, it's a Wikipedia tool. And then I'm going to make our agent executor, which is the agent that actually does the thing. And the agent executor is just a collection of tools, its agent type, and the model itself. And then I'm going to ask for its output. Can you please provide a quick summary of Napoleon, then do a separate search, and tell me what the commonalities are with Serena Williams? Which, I, I, don't, I, don't, know what the, I don't know what the, I don't know what the summary is going to be. But that's kind of the point here is it's an unknown amount here. And the agent may find that it needs more information. It may need to go to multiple pages, but then it's going to summarize uh, it back for us here. So it knows I first need to gather information about Napoleon. So it goes to the Wikipedia page because I gave it the Wikipedia tool. It's going to input Napoleon. And then here's the observation, which is what it got returned back to it. So now this is basically the Wikipedia text. It's a bunch of, bunch of text. Now that I have a detailed summary of Napoleon, I need to gather information about Serena. Goes back to Wikipedia, go to Serena. Cool. All right. Here's the really cool part. Now that I have a detailed summary of Serena Williams' life and achievements, I can now combine the two to find the commonalities. That's pretty awesome that it was able to work these two, grab these two summaries for him, and give us its output. Let's see that. Both Napoleon and Serena are recognized as one of the greatest in their respective fields. Hmm. You know what? It'd be pretty tough to find commonalities between Napoleon and Serena, but the language model did it, which is nice. <laughs> All right, so that's it. That's it for uh, summarization. That's five levels of summarization for us. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to look at the question, see if we have any for us. Oh boy, there's a bunch. Um, I won't have time to do all these because I want to get on the cool stuff. I'm gonna, just going to pick a cool one. Mm -mm. We'll, we'll do a quick, super easy one. Someone asked, how much is it per um, encoding to do an embedding? And you can see here, it's a hundredth of a cent per thousand tokens. So embedding is actually pretty cheap, which is why I like embedding forward um, applications because they're pretty cheap to do. Can I share the notebook? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll put up a QR code for it later. And then a second question around running a uh, LLM locally. Um, so then for running language models locally, this is one of those things that's kind of a pain in the butt to do right now. It will get easier, like all tech does. But now you're going to want to look at one of the open source models. My favorite is Llama 2. It's the biggest one out there. They have different sizes and different versions for it. And then you're going to want to follow a tutorial for how to get it on your computer locally or whatever machine it may be. It, like I said, there's a lot of uh, 
nuance to it, and it's pretty tricky on it right now. It takes a lot of config and a lot of customizations. I don't go too much towards that. I'm going to usually always do somebody's hosted model. So whether it's OpenAI, but then you have privacy and data concerns, or your favorite cloud provider, they already have models for you, like Google's coming out with their model, the big one, hopefully soon. Or you can go to other places like a gradient, which hosts an open source model for you. So there's a ton of options for you to pick what you like out there. But the cool part about LangChain is that you can insert any model that you want. And so the only line uh, code line that would be different is the one up at the very, very top, which is whatever API key you have, and then just pick a different model. And then everything else runs the same afterwards, which is really cool. All right, so that's it on the summarization side. Sorry if I didn't get to the other questions. I just want to move forward here. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a use case of ask a book some questions. So believe it or not, when I did this tutorial, I think it was probably back in February, back in March, it was still a pretty novel concept to combine your own data with um, a language model. It wasn't always like that. Um, if you remember, there was a day before chat GPT plugins. You know, plugins allow you to bring in some extra context in your data, into your data. This was all before that. So I think this is, while kind of a popular use case right now, I think it's really important to understand how it works because everything else just expands on top of this. And we're going to look at some advanced retrieval here in a second for that. So I'm going to load in all my good stuff. And then now I have a book on here. It's called The Field Guide to Data Science. And if you get this repo on GitHub here, I'll share the link. You get all this data right in here, so you can just run the code as you want down. So field guide to data science. OK, cool. I'm going to load up that book into some data. And let's see how big it is for us. So this Pi PDF loader, this will do some auto chunking for us. So we have 126 chunks. And this is actually, I think, per page, if I remember correctly. So we actually have 126 pages. And there are 100 in your not in your document, oh, yeah. sample document. And then we have, uh, for one of our chunks, we have 2,800 different token, uh, characters. And I can see characters, yeah, so that, you know, divided by four, 600 tokens-ish, a little bit more. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a process we're all pretty familiar with now, and this is where we're going to chunk our document up into smaller chunks. So we have 126, but I want to make it just a little bit smaller so I can put it into a prompt for us. And here I'm going to do a character limit of 2,000. And this means that it'll be around 500 tokens, so just a little bit smaller. So now we have 162 texts. So I took our 126, made it a little bit smaller, and now we have 162. Cool. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go get our embeddings. So before I go into this part, because this is where it starts getting complicated, I actually want to show what is actually going on here. Um, so let me see. OK, I didn't do en enough animations on this, but we'll just go through it. So we have our document here, which is uh, going to be our book that we're talking about. right? And then what we just did is with LangChain, we split our document up into different uh, sub-documents. And these are the child documents that are much smaller. Then what we're about to do, which I didn't do quite yet, is we're going to get embeddings for each one of those documents. So now we have a vector associated with each document string, freeform text and a vector of 1,500 length. OK, cool. The really cool part, and how this all comes together, is we're now going to ingest a user query. And the user may ask a, uh, a question about the book. And that question in this case is, what is a data scientist? All right, so now we're going to get a single vector of 1,500 length for that one. And what is going to happen underneath the hood is we're going to compare this vector from the user and we're going to go to all those 162 documents, and we're going to say, hey, which one of those documents, or maybe which two of those documents, is most semantically similar to the query that the user just gave? Now, the hypothesis here is that those documents that are returned, it has the answer that, to the user's question. And then we'll combine the user's question, put that in the prompt with a document, and ask the language model, hey, can you please answer this question based off the context you just got? That's in the high level. Let's go down into some code, and let's see how this works here. So like I said beforehand, uh, we're going to get our embeddings. So option number one, if you wanted to use a more production-grade remote vector store, 
Pinecone and Weavy8 are the ones that I see everybody use. However, you got to go make a sign up. You got an account. You got to get an account. It's a paid product. <coughs> Not what I want to do today. So I'm going to use Chroma, which is just locally. You don't have to get an account anywhere. You can just do it yourself, which is what I like. Then what we'll do is we'll take Chroma, and we're going to say, "Hey, we want you to get. We want you to load up from documents, and we're going to give it the text, the 160 something texts, and then we're going to give it our embeddings engine, which is the uh, OpenAI engine that we just created up here. And what it's going to do is it's going to do some magic underneath the hood. It's going to go get those embeddings and it's going to store them within Chroma for us. So now what we'll do is we'll take the user query. What are examples of good data science teams? And then we're going to pass that query to our Chroma and it's going to do a similarity search for us. And you may ask, well, Greg, how do you do the similarity search? And I don't see it. There's like a there's a default one. I believe it's going to be cosine similarity is the default one. But you can pick your own similarity search. Like I said, Euclidean beforehand or something else that you want. Let's go ahead and run that. So what it just did was is it took this query, embedded it, and then got the docs that are most similar to that embedding. And we can see here that the de default K is four. So it got four documents for us. And let's see what the first document looks like. Um, looks like this is the first relevant document. I only printed out the first 450 characters. And so um, it doesn't look like the, the answer may be in this document. But that's why you get multiple documents, because you're not sure which one it's exactly going to be in. And it looks like this document was picked up because it talks about data science team here. But it's the author's data science team. OK, so now what we're going to do, and this is where the magic all comes together. I'm going to do a, a QA chain, which is a, a lang chain abstraction in order to do question and answer. I'm going to do chain type of stuff because my chunks are small enough where I can just stuff it into the document. And I'm going to say, what is the collect stage of data maturity? Because this author in here, they have a five step stage for what they think uh, good data science teams do. One of those stages is collect. I'm going to pass in that query. We're going to get our docs and then we're going to run it in here. And so now it just took those documents, found the similar ones, passed it through a prompt. The collect stage of data maturity focuses on collecting internal or external data sets. This is really cool because if you were to ask, if you were to take this question and you're just going to go, let me do LLM. Oops. And you're going to pass this in here. This is the, this is the, um, this is the vanilla language model. See, it, it has a little bit of a longer one here, but when you ask it from the vanilla language model, it's pulling in from its own internal, I want to call it database. It's not a database. It's own internal training data that it's been trained on top of, and it's going to give you an answer from here. I, another rule of thumb for my LLM development, I never trust, or I don't trust what comes out of the language model facts-wise. I try not to. Any, if I'm going to trust a fact from a language model, it's going to be because I give it context. And I know the fact is in there somewhere. And I know that it used it correctly. I don't love using it for pulling, um, pulling data out of here, because that's where you get into hallucinations. And that's where it sounds pretty smart. But it, it's not actually telling you the right thing. So that's why that one's so cool. Let's see if we can do, let's look at these docs here. So what is the collect stage of data science maturity? Collect. So here, even let's look at this first document, which is really cool. This first document is, oops. This first document has a bunch of collects, the collect stage, the collect, the collect, the collect. So the answer to what the collect stage is, is in these documents. Then we just passed this whole thing into the prompt and then asked the language model, hey, given this context, what is the answer? And that's where it got, got us for us. Um, let's try a different one. What is, mm, what are some data science algorithms? Algorithms. And let's see what we have here. And there you go. So I want to check out these docs. We have another answer. Um, a whole bunch of docs here. I won't go through each one to find out where the answer is, but you can see a variable number of features, but your algorithm, it, it, talks, it starts talking about algorithms, which is really cool. So it's pulling from this book, and that's when you can do some authoritative sources. Now, say you wanted to do this, but for a different source. There's a ton of people 
doing chat your Notion, chat your G Drive, chat your website, chat, chat your <laughs> developer's documentation, chat WhatsApp, a whole bunch of stuff. And so you can take the same principle that we just talked about right here, and you can go apply it to any data source that you want. The only difference is going to be what data you actually end up loading in, which is cool. So now you know how all those chat bots on websites work. That's a little bit of a uh, it's a little bit of a ruse because the really complicated part. I know we'll all appreciate this here is syncing the source documents and your embeddings. Because remember, embeddings are in point in time. If the document updates, the embedding doesn't update, you got to go redo that because there may be inf new information in there. So that's when it gets complicated pretty quickly. And there's other tools. And in fact, that's another AI infrastructure tool that I know a lot of people are investing in. But doing that syncing between documents and embeddings really stinks. Cool. Let me check to see if there's any questions on that one. Oh yeah, we got some here. What are the strategies to select the best model for the job? Um, well, well, you kind of build an intuition on it after you've done it for a bunch, and I know that's not a satisfying answer, but I'll start with GPT-4. I'll see if it gets the job done, and if it can't do what I'm doing, then I need, I need to prompt engineer my way out of it. I need to do better retrieval, which we'll talk about in a second. And if it still can't do it, well, it's going to be hard to find a model that can do it, unless it's a hyper-specialized model. Um, if I know it's a simple task, I'll do GPT 3.5. If I know it's an extremely simple task, I'll use a relatively low-power uh, local model to go do a very fine, uh, very um, scoped-down task for me. All right, let's see what else we got here. Sure, so there's a good question. And I, I do want to talk about this because I haven't actually talked about it yet. Um, there was a question on why do I set temperature equals zero? So this is a good, good um, topic. What is temperature? The way that I think about temperature is the liber liberalness of the model. So it's how creative the model will be. It's how flower flowery the language will be on its output. So it's a range between zero and one. If you were to put one, well, then it's going to just get very loose and kind of very rambunctious with its output. And I know it's weird to describe a computer as rambunctious, but you should go and test it out. That's how it looks like. I do temperature equals zero because in theory, that's as close to determinism as you can get for these models. Another huge, really interesting topic is, well, aren't these models deterministic? And the answer is not all the time. And if you ask OpenAI, why is your model not deterministic? There was a period where they didn't know why, and they thought it was a race condition in the hardware for why certain things would happen, which is, again, mind-blowing that this stuff is out there, and we're not really sure how it's all working. But So temperature equals zero. I do that for factual things when I need to recite from context, because I don't want it to get too creative on me. Hmm. Cool. I'm going leave it, to leave it at that one. Um, so that's how you ask a book a question. Now, if we were to summarize, or the, the easy part about what we did, let me the easy part about what we did is really right here. So we did doc search dot similarity search. So what it did was, is it just went and pulled the top K similar documents. That's a very naive way to go get your, to go get the relevant information. Your domain may have um, uh, restrictions where you need to go get other types of documents. So let's say you're in the legal field and you want to know about, and I'm completely making this up, I'm not in legal, you want to know about car accidents. Well, you may not want to know about, you, you may not want five documents just all about car accidents. You may want a supporting document that's how to proceed after a car accident or something like that. And so in order to do more advanced retrieval, well, you need more advanced methods to do retrieval other than just the simple you know, similarity search here. And that's the next, next notebook that we're going to look at is advanced retrieval with LangChain. Now, I won't go into this one too deeply. This is more just to spur some cool ideas within your head for ways to do your own programming for this. And I'll skip over the intro here. <coughs> but the first thing that we're going to do is we'll load up our tech doc text documents again. And I'm doing more, more Paul Graham. 
Oh, that's going to... Uh, no, that won't take too long. That's pretty quick. Um, so I'm loading up Paul, Gress, uh, Paul Graham's essays, and this is his large one. So this is something like 50 different essays or something like that. And what I want to do is I want to show you five different other retrieval methods besides just similarity search. And this is on the more advanced side because when you start architecting your program, you see, may see that your domain um, requires something a bit more complicated here. Come on now. There we go. So we have 49 Paul Graham, Paul Graham essays loaded. Um, I'm going to split all those, and now we have 471 chunks. Cool. There's some markdown notes. Oh, that should be markdown. Markdown notes for me. Okay, cool. I'm going to make my vector DB, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my embeddings engine, and this is just the vector dance that we've been doing a whole bunch, and I'm going to get 471 vectors. I'm going to go in the vector DB, and now I'm going to do our first really cool retrieval method. So this one's called multi-query. Now, if you remember back here, I asked one question, which was, what are some data science algorithms? And it did a similarity search just off that one query. But what if your user is not very descriptive or they use really plain language? It'd be pretty nice to have multiple queries that were all kind of related to each other, but different that you could go get similar, you can go get similar docs for. So what multi-query does, I'm gonna log this in so we can see the output. I'm going to ask a test question right here. And this is my question. This may be a question from your user. What is the author's view on early stages of the startup? Let me go ahead and run this. And when we actually do run this, I won't spoil the surprise yet, but here's the logging. So what it did for, what it did for us is it generated some other synthetic queries that the user didn't ask, but are similar to the user's original question. So how does the author's perspective uh, on the early stages of startup? What are the author's thoughts on the initial phases of the startup? What are the author's perspectives on the beginning stages of the startup? So now, if your first query that the user uh, gave you didn't quite do the job, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go get docs that are similar to all these. And then we're going to deduplicate them at, with a union. And then we're going to answer the question. So if we take a look at how many docs we have, we have eight unique docs that match these. They could be different. If I were to go just run similarity search on all these four different questions, I may get 12, but two, you know, four of them are the same so they combine them. And then what I'm going to do is this time I'm not going to use the QA chain. I'm just going to do it manually. Use the following pieces of context to answer the question at the end. Here's the context. I'm going to pass it the eight similar docs that we had. Here's a question from the user. And you know, go give me the answer. And let's go see it here. So it's going to take those. The author believes that it's important for startups to release early versions of the product quickly and then improve it. Cool. So we just took a bunch of Paul Graham's essays, chunked them up, got the eight best documents via multi-query, and then answered the question from there. Nice. I think that one's pretty cool. Next, we're going to go on to advanced method number two. And if I thought the previous one was pretty cool, I think this one's really cool too. <laughs> so contextual compression. I think we all know compression when you make something smaller. But now in the world of language models, what blows my mind is you can make it small, make a piece of text smaller by making it more dense with information. I call this one the fluff remover. Because if you have a chunk that's like 2,000 tokens, but the good stuff can be reduced down to like 500 tokens, well, this one's going to reduce it down for you. So, and the reason why you do this is not only to save on cost, but it's also because, remember when I said, if you put in too much information into your prompt, it could start to confuse the model. And so the, the fewer tokens, the better, because you have more dense information. So let's go ahead and let's just run through this one, just blowing through it. And so the way this gets set up actually is Langchain gives you a compressor. And it's basically going to just be a, a language model compressor. And then you get a compression retriever, which is, again, a, kind of another verbose, um, I mean, look how long this variable name is. Uh, it's another uh, way of getting the retriever from the compression. And then so here we're looking at our raw document. And so this one's pretty long. Um, I don't know how many tokens this is. We could see it, but let's just see characters. 1,500 characters. OK, cool. What I want to do now is I want to take that same document, and I want to compress it contextually. Now, here's what's really cool. I, again, I'm just so giddy by this stuff. You can't just compress it without knowing with what context you want to compress it with, is you know, pretend in your document you have information about dogs, cats, and birds. Well, if your user wants to know about birds, 
you don't need anything about dogs or cats. You only need the birds part. So with your compressor, you also need to pass it. What is the user asking about? So in this essay, I know that Paul Graham is um, talking about tests that he likes to do for himself. I'm going to run this. It's running through, letting it do its thing. Cool. So now here's the raw text that Paul Graham had, but instead of it being however long this one is, uh, 1500 characters, it's going to be a lot shorter. And so we just did contextual compression on this big, long document. Now, if you did this for a whole bunch of documents, yes, it'll be expensive, but you will get performance increases. And our optimization uh, metric isn't always cost. It could be performance, which is really cool here. So now what we're going to do is, what are the author's early, view just, uh, early views on early stages of startup? I'm going to run this one, and it's doing that same question that we had up above, but it's not generating multiple queries this time. It's doing contextual compression on each one of the chunks. So it's only pulling out the good stuff from each one of those chunks. And if I were to run this through, this might take a little bit further. Let's see what we got here. If this one takes too long, you'll just have to take my word for it and we'll move on to the next one. We'll give it a sec here. We'll see if it finishes. But then what we'll do is I'm gonna do, again, do my manual prompt and I'm gonna pass it the context, which is the uh, compressed docs that we had up above. I'm gonna pass it the user's question, and then I'm gonna say one more time, hey, go and answer this question for us. All right, nice. So now we have our shorter documents from Paul Graham, and we had four of them. Shorter documents, cool. Pass those into our relevant, the relevant docs, pass it into our prompt that we just made. Oh, that's not good. I wanna do that one. Cool, we'll pass that in, and it will go ahead and answer our question for us using those compressed docs. Cool. Now, is the answer better? It's up to each person to decide. It's really hard to do evals on whether or not a, an answer to a question is better. Um, there's some creative ways to do evals, though. Some people like the thumbs up, thumbs down that you give to your user. It's not bad, but then it requires user action. Another interesting way that I like to see it too is some people do autocomplete for your AI application and you give the user a piece of text. Well, how often is the user editing that piece of text that you gave it? If it's a lot, well, then maybe it's not that good. If they accept it as always, well, then maybe it's doing, it's doing better. But either way, for evals, you're likely going to have a human in the loop for that. Awesome. Let's move on to our next advanced retriever. So this is a uh, parent document retriever. And this is another really cool one too. So you remember that we made embeddings for our documents. The hard part is sometimes those documents are really long. So say that's like 5,000 tokens and you get a single embedding for that 5,000 tokens. Well, there could be a lot of topics within that, um, within that document itself. And which topics are going to be represented in that embedding? All of them? I don't know. One, two? You have to decide that for yourself. Um, and the strategy here is what you actually want to do is you want to split that document up into really small chunks, get vectors for those small chunks, which in theory should match uh, the information density a whole lot more. And so it's easier to understand what's going on there. We'll go ahead and run these. We have our child splits right there. And so now what we're doing is we're basically, we made really small uh, chunks with our um, chunk size of only 400. This is only 100 characters, or 100 tokens, which is really not that big. And it's going through those, making all those different chunks. And then, let's see here. Oh yeah, it's adding those. It's probably a whole bunch, which is why it's giving us a hard time here. But either way, it's going through and it's creating those uh, child documents for us. And so now what we can do is when we do our similarity search, we can go get those child documents. And they should, in theory, be a lot more dense with information for the embedding because it's so small. Now, OK, well, what makes this parent document retriever cool? Well, let's say that your domain, it's really important that you have information before the relevant part and after the relevant part. So yes, you found that some child document was really important. But the really cool part is when you can get the parent document of that child. So let's say, for example, that this chunk right here came from uh, Paul Graham's essays, VC squeeze.txt. Cool. This child chunk was a part of a bigger parent document. I want to pass that parent document 
to my prompt. The parent document's not very good to do semantic search on. The child document is better for that. So we're going to go through here. Let's get these. I just want to show you the cool part. Now we do the parent splitter. So the child document, the child splitter is only 400 characters. The parent doctor, parent, parent splitter is 2,000. So we're going to get the parent uh, document ret ret returned for us. Let's go through these. We're going quick because we want to do some other cool stuff here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through that. We're going to provide the parent document that the child document was matched for. We're going to pass in that context. We're going to pass in the user question. And then the user question will be, what is some investing advice? And we see what it says here. Let's see where we're getting caught up. Again, it's adding documents. We're, we're dealing with kind of a, a big number of documents here, which is why this is slower for us. But this is a good point because we're just doing embeddings. And so there is latency with embeddings, which kind of stinks. 385 documents. There's the sub docs. There's the one larger doc. And now it's answering our question for us. What is some investing advice? So now we just went through Paul Graham's essay, 49 of his essays, and pulled out his best investing advice. And I shouldn't say best because it's still TBD if it is his best. We pulled out some investing advice from Paul Graham. The next one's really easy. Ensemble retriever. This means you're going to pull in multiple retrievers together. Um, one of the popular search methods that people like doing today is you not only do semantic search, which means you, you do meaning, but you also do good old vanilla keyword search. And when you combine the two together, people like to call that hybrid search, which that's a type of ensemble. Because what we're going to do here is, I, I won't even run through it, um, but basically we create an ensemble retriever for us. And then we're going to specify our two sub-retrievers. So we had our regular vector DB, which is going to do a similarity search for us. And then we're going to do hybrid. And then we can pass in the same context that we had beforehand, and it gives us the answer. And then the last really cool one that we have is self-querying. This is more agent-like. But say, for example, that you're actually querying a, um, well, let's say you have a bunch of documents that are from a bunch of different essays. And you only want to select documents from a specific essay. Well, how do you know which specific essay to pull from? Well, you're going to want to pull the one that's relevant to the user. And so the way that this works is it's pretty sweet. You give in a schema, which is going to be an attribute about your documents. So remember, all those documents, they can hold metadata in them. And so I'm calling this metadata that I have in one of my documents. It's the source, which is like the where the essay came from. It's the file name of the essay. It's a, it's a type string. Cool. And then what I'm going to do here is I got to give the, um, it needs to know what filters to pick. So it needs to know a little bit about what uh, documents you have. And we're going to go ahead and retrieve those. And here's the awesome part. Only return one essay. What is the one thing that you can do to figure out what you like to do from source? And then I give it the actual essay that I want it to go from. And the reason why this self-querying re uh, retriever is so cool is because it will go and it will know, oh, I need to apply a filter. I'm going to go ahead and apply that one. So the query is what you like to do. This is the way it'll do the semantic search on. And it knows to do a filter for us. And this is where some of the magic happens with LangChain. We're going to do a comparison filter. It's going to be equals. And it's where the source field uh, on the metadata field on the document equals this essay. Not only that, I said only return one essay. And it said limit of one, too, which is really nice. So this is when your retriever starts to get a little bit more smarts behind it. And um, it starts to get a little bit more smarts behind it. Now, one thing I did cover up here is the user is not going to input this exact, uh, this exact file name. They, they, they may not know what the file name is. And so LangChain right now, um, I haven't found a way to do really kind of intelligent finding out what your filters are and what the values for those filters are. But this is why it's still an open area and still very cool. And if anybody comes up with a cool method for that, I would love to see it. And that's on the assemble side. I think I just do another example here. Beautiful. Let's do those. Um, nice. So that's advanced virtual link chain. We absolutely blew through those. But it was more to less understand the exact code, because you can always go check out this notebook later. And it's more just to understand the cool different types of advanced uh, retrievals that are out there for it. Now, I see that we have 15 minutes. I'm going to be very strict on time for us. I want you all to get out of here until 4.30. And we're going to do one more topic. 
And this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. And we're going to talk about um, getting structured text out, structured data out of text. The reason why I like this one, and I think it's so cool, is because it's so applicable. And one of the huge business opportunities out there right now is, I mean, data businesses are just massive right now. People who go and do research for certain people. Those people get paid money because it's a pain in the butt to extract structured data from unstructured sources. Well, all of a sudden with language models, you just unlocked a whole new way to process freeform text and to get structured data out of it. So I think there's a lot of data sources that aren't being tapped right now that could be tapped by extracting structured data out of them. And I'm gonna show you one example I came up with here um, that will demonstrate that. So we already looked at a little bit of extraction. I'm gonna use 3.5 Turbo just because it's cheap and easy to start here. And so we talked about function calling. I'm actually gonna skip over the JSON schema because I don't even wanna, okay, no, actually we'll go into just a little bit. But the cool parts here is I'm gonna ask for structured data out and I'm gonna ask a food that is mentioned, and I'm gonna ask whether or not the user thought it was good or bad. The reason why I do this is because imagine you were on Yelp, you were running product at Yelp, and you wanted to know sentiment and reviews. Well, let's see what the users have to say about it. I'm gonna pass in, this is a chat a message. You are a helpful AI bot. The user, which this looks like it's a chat message, like the user actually types this in. This could be just a review in your database. Could be, I mean, it doesn't have to come directly from the user. We're gonna say, I thought the burgers were awesome. And we're gonna pass in the functions, which is what we um, listed up above. And I wanna make that food. Nice. And so now let's get the output from it. And so if we run this, which was super quick, we get, get food mentioned, food, burgers, was it good or bad? The user thought it was good. Beautiful, that's easy. But like I said beforehand, I like the Pydantic model because um, it looks cleaner and it Makes it just makes it feel just a lot more structured for me. We'll do the same exact thing that we had before. We'll pass in our messages. We'll have our food extractor, and now we'll type in our um, our schema, which is just the model that comes up from up above here. And you can see that this model takes in uh, an enum as well, good or bad. Let's go ahead and load that. We'll look at the output that comes from it. Again, we use the food extractor. We got burgers, and they were good from the user. Nice. So a little bit of extraction, a little bit of tagging as well. All right, now what if we want multiple results? Oh, yeah, let's, get, let's do multiple results here. Cool. So here, I'm doing a sequence of foods. And so Amy likes burgers and fries, but doesn't like salads. Okay, well, let's see what Amy likes. Amy, burgers, good, nice. Fries, good. Salads, bad. So you can extract multiple things from your list here. All right, now, Another really fun one that I think is super cool is the user query extraction. So again, this is gonna come in when a user types in something into your website and you need to extract a structured query from it. So here I'm doing a financial model and the user wants to actually query its financial model. So there's three attributes we need to do a successful query. What is the thing, the category, the amount the user's talking about? What is the actual amount? This is the magnitude. And what is the year they care about? So for example, can you please add 10 more units to inventory in 2022? Now, it may be like, well, Greg, what's so cool about this? I mean, this is freeform text from the user. And now we're turning this into a structured, what could be a structured query. Of course, your production instance will be more complicated than this. But now we have, oh, we want to add to inventory, add 10 in the year 2022. Before language models, this would have been really really tough to do with regular NLP. And it looks like I'm already doing a spoiler, but remove three million from revenue in 2021. It's revenue, minus three, 2021. You t you, you're gonna go and take this, you're gonna go put it right into your query engine. You're gonna go get the answer from your query engine, whatever the answer may be. And you're gonna go throw it into another prompt and then go give that to your user. And then all of a sudden you have the response for you. Now I'm gonna wrap up with one, uh, real world example for this here. So <laughs> I started this project called uh, <clears throat> Opening Attributes. It's a side project. And I wanted to do a B2B example of data extraction. Now, I remember talking to a salesperson once and they said, Greg, we need leads of people that use NetSuite. I said, interesting. How do you go and find NetSuite customers? 
they rattled off some ways. The one that stood out to me was, we go and check job descriptions. And if NetSuite is listed in the job description because the person needs to know it, well, then it's likely that they're using NetSuite at that company. Oh, cool. So you could apply that for if they use Salesforce, if they use NetSuite, if they use some technology. And so then all of a sudden, you might be able to have a leads list if you were to do this at scale and go and extract all that structured data. So I was like, this is a perfect example. I need some structured data out. And so what we're going to do here is I'm going to skip over explaining this one, but we're going to use Greenhouse, which is a um, job tracking system, and they have a public API. So you can go and just query jobs, which is pretty nice. And I'm going to go pull some jobs from Okta. And let's see how many jobs Okta has for us today. It has 154 jobs uh, pulled. OK, cool. I'm just going to look at the first job. And if we were to take a look at the absolute URL, let's take a look at this one. Let's go see what this one is. Does anybody in here work for Okta? No hands. OK, that's good. Um, so it looks like it's an account receivables manager, AWS. <coughs> Marketplace. Cool. I won't spoil the surprise, but let's go through this. And then so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just going to, uh, well, first, yeah, I'm going to clean this up a little bit just so we can see what's going on. So now we have a job right here. We have a job ID. We have the link to the job. We have when it was updated, the title, and here's the content. However, you notice that this content is um, encoded for HTML. That's no good. If you can do any cleanup for your language model before you give it information, it's always a good idea. So don't go and pass this to the language model. It might be able to get it, but you're wasting tokens talking about styling, and you don't want to do that. So I'm going to use beautiful soup. We're going to parse it. And now here is the actual job description. So here's the job description that comes through right here. It matches what is Okta's the world, world's greatest identity company. Matches right there. Cool. Then what we're going to go through is now I'm going to create my schema. So this is the data that I want to extract from the job description itself. This is where the cool part starts to happen. Because what I want is I want a list of tools, or I guess I want a single tool, which is just going to be a name. Oh, Name of the tool mentioned. Nice. And then I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to group them together and I'm asking for a sequence of tools. If you wanted to, and then I give it some examples here too. So if it says Net, NetSuite or Looker, give me NetSuite or Looker, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Excel. Nice. Let's run through that. I'm going to create an extraction chain. This is a lang chain abstraction. I'm going to give it the pedantic schema of tools that I just made, pass in the language model. And then here's the cool part. So in this text variable is stored the job description. So, oh man, the spoiler's already there. Text indices, oh boy, let's see what we got here. Let's try this one more time. Oh, beautiful. Um, so now, we're, now it's processing that, and it's going to go extract the tools from that job description, given the schema that I gave it. Let's give it a sec here. That's sweet. Well, Okta, of course. AWS Marketplace. OK, sure, because that's, that's what the job is, is about. So you see it's not perfect, but it looks like they use Tackle. They use Salesforce, NetSuite, and also SFDC. So it didn't know to combine these, but you can do some post-processing to combine them if you need to. Same thing with this Tackle right here. But let's go, let's go check. Wow. Well, oh, that's sweet. Oh, cool. So now it uses AWS, Tackle, Salesforce, and NetSuite. If you tried doing this with just regular keywords, you'd have to know like, what keywords to search for beforehand. That's a big pain in the butt. I didn't tell it Salesforce or Tackle before, but it was able to extract that for us. And if we, but here's the other downside. Here's a little helper function to tell us how much that query just cost to go and do that. So I'm doing that same thing. I'm going to print the total tokens, prompt, completion, successful. So that one query I just did cost four cents, four and a half cents. So if you have, you know, there's 140 jobs in there. It's like four bucks just for Okta. If you have like 10,000 companies, you're looking at a whole bunch of cash to extract that, which is where it, it starts to become advantageous to do uh, local models or cheaper models. Um, I put out this project, and it got a fair amount of uh, insight, or a fair amount of uh, traction. It, it went well. People wanted to buy the data. Um, I, this isn't full time for me, so I haven't done that yet. But if anybody's out there that wants to do it, I put in a uh, an email from an investor that said, yes, we want this. So there's extraction opportunities everywhere, 
all, all the way around about it. Um, this is a fun one. That's my last favorite use case for Langchain for us. Um, it's a developing field. Not all the answers are out there. But one of the things that I love the most is that we're all discovering it as we go here. So my traditional background um, is not necessarily deep data science, deep algorithms, deep any of that stuff, yet I can still contribute to this field because it's a level playing field when you start looking at language models. And it just takes a little creative thinking and creativity to figure out how we're gonna do this. The other example I love to say is, y'all might have heard of Baby AGI which is a fun kind of agent program that does a lot of really cool planning. The person who created that was a VC. Now, he's a, he's a scrappy technical VC, but he's not a developer by trade. And he still made this thing that absolutely took the world by storm and made people really rethink about how they want to do uh, agents. So I'm excited that you all came to this talk, and I hope that we can inspire you to go build, go share on Twitter, and go help push this field forward. So thank you. <laughs>